Well, hello, everybody. This is Tim Green with Rattle Magazine. Welcome to Rattlecast number 103. Thanks so much for joining me. Today's guest is Jack Riddle. We'll be here with him in just a moment. But before we begin, I should say that Rattle is a publication of the Rattle Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit working to promote the practice of poetry. We've been in continuous publication since 1995 and are unaffiliated with any other organization. We just do this because we love poetry, and I know you do too because you are here with us live. So thank you so much for that. If you would, please do click the like button and show all the computers that you love us too. Uh, Make sure you're subscribed or make sure you click anything you can click, whichever platform you're watching this. I'm trying to get this running on uh, YouTube right now. And that was the, the brief delay. Let me try one more time. There's a setting that was not picking up. Let me try it again. See if it works this time. Okay, so something weird was going on, but now it works. So we are on YouTube, too. We're Twitter, too. Okay, so we should be running on every platform. Um, Thanks again for joining us. Now, uh, Jack Riddle will be here in just a little bit, but before we do, like we always do, it's fun to start out with Poets Respond Live and check out poems about the news. And this first poem, uh, the, today's poem uh, from July 25th, was by Brock Guthrie. And uh, it was a poem in memory of Biz Markey, who is a, a rapper, a hip-hop artist that I'm not familiar with. I, I've, I mean, I knew his one hit song, Just a Friend, sounded familiar once I looked it up again. Um, but I wasn't really familiar with him. But um, he was an artist that, that meant a lot to this poet, Brock Guthrie. And um, I'll read his note here. And then we'll uh, read his poem. Uh, Brock Guthrie says, here, let me put it on screen. Um, There we go. Brock Guthrie says, uh, R.I.P. hip-hop legend Biz Markie, a fixture of my rap fanatical youth, a fanaticism that must have something to do with my efforts to become a poet. I feel like a different, better poem might keep the focus on biz, but celebrity encounters as much as we'd like to believe otherwise in the moment are one-sided. They exist in one memory. So this is what came out. Part homage to a celebrity artist, part elegy for an earlier version of myself, and with a bit about Frost's momentary stay against confusion, which has always made sense to me as a definition of poetry, part ars poetica. And um, I can't play... um, the song, um, Just a Friend by Biz Markie, because um, of copyright restrictions and all that. Um, if we did, they'd put commercials up into our YouTube stream and, um, and maybe block our Facebook stream. That happens sometimes um, because of copyright violations. So you'll have to look that poem up yourself, Just a Friend. But once you hear the chorus and the refrain on that, you'll remember it. And uh, Brock couldn't join us today. He is in a cabin in the woods with very bad Wi-Fi. So I'm going to read this for him, and maybe uh, maybe he'll add audio later. Uh, here it is. Brock, um, Brock Guthrie's poem, Bismarcky and Me. I saw him in New Orleans in 2005, 15 years after his smash hit Just a Friend. He was crossing the street with an entourage of four. I was, it, I was at a red light on Decatur, Decatur and Canal. Early spring, already hot, not a lot of people out. I think it was a Thursday. My left hand on the steering wheel, I sort of pointed and thought, Biz. His crew must have sensed it. They elbowed him like, look, boss, a true fan. And true would have been accurate because it's not as if he was conspicuous. He was just a guy walking down the street with friends. So my spotting him revealed a nuanced appreciation, not only for obscurely iconic American faces, but also for the texture of fading stardom against the black cloth of time's passing. They were right to be impressed. But here's the remarkable thing. He jump-stopped, turned, and pointed at me. Smile full of tongue, the clown prince of hip-hop, the human beatbox who'd made one of the all-time best anthems to unrequited love with a crazy, catchy chorus any vocally challenged asshole could feel good about singing in the car or the club. You got what I need, but you say he's just a friend. You say he's just a friend. Ooh, baby, you. And there we were, the biz and me and Nola, one spring afternoon in 2005, pointing to each other for a good long second. Then he walked on. Marcel Theo Hall. I wish I could properly identify how this memory makes me feel, happy on the one hand, but also a little shameful, shallow, because big fucking deal, and yet I remember how I reached for my phone to take a picture, 
Worse, I convinced myself of a lie that rode me the whole way home. I thought Biz would have shared a beer with me, had I only parked my car and followed his crew into whatever quarter bar they were headed to. Hey man, it's me, the guy from the car. Imagine his reaction. The confusion of those days. Daytime drinking was often what's for dinner. Disaster averted, I say, in a roundabout way. It's like that Frost poem, a passing glimpse, where he remembers seeing flowers vaguely from trains and laments he can't go back and properly identify them. But then he figures, fuck it, and thought is good enough because the thought can become a poem, a stay against confusion. That's how I'd like to feel about the memory. Sloshy Brock, Frosty Rob, Biz Markey, momentarily stayed here happily. And that is a poem in memory of Biz Markey, who passed away this week at 57, um, uh, by Brock Guthrie. And uh, we have another poem, too, that I wanted to share. And um, this poem is going to be Tuesday's poem. It's another poem about fire. Um, We have, you know, there's themes every week. And um, the fire theme comes up every summer pretty, pretty regularly. This week, the other theme that came up a lot was Jeff Bezos, but we already had a Jeff Bezos in this in space poem last week. So um, I went with this for our second poem that we had room for. This is Lynn Thompson, who was the guest on Rattlecast number four, I believe. And uh, she is, of course, the poet laureate of Los Angeles right now and writes this memory. Um, her note here. A New York Times article described the bootleg fire in Oregon as creating its own weather. I couldn't help but recall a more innocent time when fires, though devastating, were not as horrific as those we all face today. That is uh, Lynn Thompson's note, and uh, here is her poem, which I will let her read for you. Here we go. This is Lynn Thompson reading Bootleg Fire. Bootleg Fire. In California... There were seasons for fires, once. When Motown released Martha and her Vandellas heat wave and I shimmied with the doorknob because I was a believer that tomorrow was a vow lit from within, the season usually began with a rudely named Indian summer and was over just about the time the family sat down to gorge on turkey flash dancing in filmy gravy, macaroni and cheese and collard greens. There's no such season anymore, and fires are no longer content to play by themselves. See how Oregon's bootleg fire isn't fire only, is lightning, is generator of its own weather, and the clouds pyrocumulonimbus? Remember Mrs. Dent, second grade, who taught us nimbostratus, cumulus, and we, thinking that was all there was, hung from monkey bars, skipped rope, stole home. And that was Lynn Thompson once again, the poet laureate of Los Angeles. Congratulations to Lynn for that. Um, Reading Bootleg Fire, her poem about uh, the bootleg fire. And, uh, you know, I can't, I can't let uh, fires go you know, without saying living in a fire zone that um, the real issue with the fires going on, which makes these pyro-nimbul- pyrocumulonimbus clouds, is um, it has to do much more with forest management than, than climate change, actually. Um, and if, if you look back, there's some great studies that show the myth versus the reality. But the thing is that fires are a normal, natural part of this landscape here. And we've been suppressing them since the 1950s. And um, if you look out, let me, let me show you. We have our nature cam set up here. here we go. Here's the nature cam. And these are, this is right out my window. This is my view. And uh, those are Jeffrey Pines out there. They're like 200 feet tall. And if you look, if you can see um, how the lower limbs are all dead and falling off, that's because these trees live through fire as part of the natural life cycle. And uh, a tall tree like this might live... This is probably a 70-year-old tree, maybe, the ones that we're looking at out here. And, and the actual average fire regime, regime throughout nature is about um, 14 to 20 years, maybe, a fire comes through. Uh, but what we've been doing for the last, for the last 70 years is uh, suppressing them. It's the age of fire suppression. And so the fuel loads underneath the trees build up, and, um, and there's more and more fuel. 
So uh, if there hasn't been a fire through an area, there's decades and decades of fuel buildup and uh, that wasn't there before. And that's really the main cause of the really intense fires that we have these days that, that create these pyrocumulonimbus clouds that uh, Lynn Thompson was talking about. And it is very different living here than it used to be. Um, it's terrifying this time of year. So it's always interesting to, um, to read poems about the fires. And, um, and that was just some beautiful lines looking back. A believer that tomorrow was a vow lit from within. I love that phrase, too. So thanks to Lynn Thompson for sharing that. Lynn is at a reading right now. And um, a live reading in person, and so can't uh, couldn't be on the the show today. So uh, so we'll have to give a shout out to her and uh, talk to her soon. Now I'm going to take a quick break and get to our main guest, Jack Riddle. So I'm going to put up the splash screen, a little bit of music, and uh, we will be right back with Jack Riddle. <laughs> And we are back. Uh, Jack Riddle is here on the line. Jack Riddle, uh, we published him in, in several issues of Riddle. I didn't count the number, but it's maybe three or four times, maybe more than that. Uh, Jack Riddle taught at Hope College from 1971 until retiring in 2006. He's the author of several collections of poetry and has also published more than 300 poems and journals, and his work included in numerous anthologies. He has given readings of his work and led workshops at colleges, universities, art colleges, and other venues around the country. More than 85 of his former students are now published authors, and nine of his students appear in 25 under 25. Uh, blind judged by Naomi Sheeb Nye. Uh, Riddle grew up in both the world of basketball, where his father was a well-known head coach at Westminster College and the University of Pittsburgh, and the world of the circus, inherited from his mother's family. Riddle lives a short walk from Douglas Beach, the most beautiful of Lake Michigan's disappearing public beaches with his wife, the writer and artist Julie Riddle, and a few barely domesticated beasts. Uh, his daughter is the artist Meredith Riddle. Uh, here he is, Jack Riddle. Hello, Jack. How you doing? Hello, Tim. Thank you for uh, welcoming us to uh, the program. Yeah, I'm so glad. Let me get your screen size sized okay. in. Um, here we go. So, yeah, it's just a pleasure having you on. Um, I've been a fan of your work. I mean, ever since um, you, you submitted some poems and we published a few, and then you sent a review copy of uh, Practicing to Walk Like a Heron, which I just loved. It's a great book. And then your, your subsequent books, um, St. Peter and the Goldfinch and the older one, Broken Symmetry, are just great, too. Uh, do you want to start us out with a poem? I'd love to. Um... Start us off with. Uh, do you have the the book against elegies, or do you have only? Do you have broken symmetry? I have broken symmetry, Saint Peter, and and the heron. Okay, let's uh, let's start off with a poem from Broken Symmetry called "Against Elegies." That's on page ten. Okay, just just to get us uh, off uh, on the start of what I think all of us would love to pay attention to, rather than. <laughs> <laughs> what we end up paying attention to, right? So, Against Elegies, page 10. I'm tired of death's allure, of how the old beggar makes me think that rowing across the river is somehow richer, more serious than the center of a pomegranate or my dog's way of sleeping on his paws. I'm tired of the beauty of the elegy, the tone-deaf lyricism of it all, I want death to listen for a while to Bud Powell or Art Blakey, to have to stare for seven hours at Matisse. I want him to do stand-up and play the banjo, to have to tap dance and juggle, to play Trivial Pursuit and weed my garden. 
I'm tired of how death throws his voice and gets us to judge a begonia, a song in the shower, a voice an old dog. I want life's ragged way of getting along, the wasted afternoon and empty morning, the sloppy kiss. I want to stagger along between innings. I want the burnt toast, the forgotten note, the lost pillowcase, the dime novel, the silly putty of it all. That was a against elegies and that line, that silly putty of it all uh, is a great, great way to, um, the whole poem is a great way to describe your work, which is, um, and I feel like it's very much, um, poetry about the, the, the spirituality of everyday life, maybe, um, you know, it's, it's another, it's a, it's a poetry of noticing and, um, appreciating the world as it is. And, and, um, do you want to talk a little bit about how you became a poet and, uh, and what, you know, what led you to this place? Sure. Um, I, uh, I think I loved it as a kid and then I paused for a while, but then I, I started out writing songs for the poet Lee Young Lee's sister. Hmm. And then, uh, she got married and said she would only sing for her children from then on. And I didn't want to go through that whole music business anymore. So I wrote a whole, I figured, well, since I wrote these songs, I could write a poem, you know, come on. And uh, so I showed a bunch of them to the poet Paul Zimmer and asked him uh, what he thought and if he'd help me. And he read one, two, three, and then he said, sure, I'll help you, but we're going to have to start all over. <laughs> <laughs> and then he said, I'll tell you when I think you've written a poem. And six weeks went by and he said nothing. I said, should I quit? He said, well, sure, if you want to. Well, coaches, kids don't quit. And uh, two and a half years later, I walked in with a poem and handed it to him. And he said, you did it. That's your poem. So, so you have to explain that. How did you end up writing songs for uh, Lee Young Lee's sister? Well, I was just writing them. And um, she was looking for a songwriter who had a, well, as she put it, you're the one person I found that has, that writes a Western song with an Eastern sensibility. Interesting. And I was really f struck by that. Uh, I said, you know, I didn't know that. <laughs> and uh, so there was a moment there of uh, wonderful self-awareness from her. Uh, and that's how it started. She had been uh, at the college um, where my I went and my father was the, the, the coach. And so that's how she knew me. And she knew that I had been writing these songs and had nowhere to go with them, really. So that's how that. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's a, sort of an inter interesting coincidence. Uh, and oh yeah, do you want to explain a little bit about your father too? Because you were in the um, athlete poets issue that we did, um, and yeah. your fa your father. So you were a big basketball player, and your father was a coach, um, a famous coach at, at the U Pitt. Yeah. Um, and, and what was it like growing up with him? And um, and you already mentioned that the work ethic was part of um, your your writing ethic now that you carried over. Um, but but what was that like growing up? I mean, he was uh, he was famous for uh, inventing the amoeba, amoeba defense, right? Do you amoeba want to explain? Defense. That's right. Yeah. Do you want to explain what that is a little bit? Well, the amoeba defense. Uh, actually, I was with him one time, and we were uh, and he we were watching a game, and he said, "You know, uh, you know, in a man to man, you guard your man, and in a zone, when your a man comes into your zone, you guard that man. What if you guarded nobody?" What if you stood between all the all the opposition and cut off all the passing lanes and you guarded passing lanes instead? So it was always shifting and turning. And if you watch any game today, you could watch a sixth grade game and you'll see kids turning toward the ball instead of just watching their man. Hmm. So so that uh, name came when he first tried it out uh, down at the University of Virginia and they slaughtered Virginia. And afterwards, they asked uh, Virginia's coach, what was going on out there? <laughs> and the coach said, I have no idea, but it looked like an amoeba to me. <laughs> and that's how it got its name. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that is really cool. So uh, so I, I imagine, though, that you grew well, up and, uh, and were, were working out, you know, working to be a basketball player for most of your oh, yeah. younger life. I mean, a coach's yeah. kid. I mean, that's what you would right. be doing, right? 
That's right. Um, yeah, how many times did you dribble with your left hand a day, you know, after uh-huh. school? Um, yeah, I don't know that uh, I would have been a, a, a ball player without him, but what was interesting is he, it was just assumed. Uh, he never forced anything on me. He taught me really well, mm-hmm. uh, but um, I never felt, I, I, I only felt obligated, not by him, but by the fact that I was a coach's son. I just felt obligated to be an athlete. So I was a shortstop in baseball and a uh, point guard. Nowadays, they call it a point guard mm-hmm. in basketball. And, uh, and I learned, I loved practice. Um, I was terrified during a game, just like right now, you know, facing Tim Steele. Tim Green, I'm just terrified. <laughs> no, there's, there's nothing but, to be nothing to be scared. But when of. I practiced for four hours this afternoon, Tim, <laughs> um, that was fun. I mean, that was a good time. But now, oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think uh, reading a poem is probably like shooting free throws. Do you want to shoot another one? Sure. Actually, how about one that uh, kind of has to do with that? It's called uh, "My Brother a Star." And this is in Goldfinch on page 17. And uh, fits that pretty well, I think, what it, what it was like. Um, here we go. My brother, a star. My mother was pregnant through the first nine games of the season. We were seven and two. I waited for a brother. My father kept to the hard schedule. Waking the morning of the 10th game, I thought of skipping school and shooting hoops. My cornflakes were ready, soggy. There was a note. The baby may come today. Get your hair cut. We were into January and the long December snow had turned to slush. The wind was mean. My father was gone. I looked in on my mother still asleep and hoped she'd be okay. I watched her, dreamed her dream. John at forward, me at guard, he'd learn fast. At noon, my father picked me up at the playground. My team was ahead by six. We drove toward the gym. Mom's okay, he said, and tapped his fist against my leg. The Plymouth ship that rode the hood pulled us down the street. The baby died, he said. I felt my feet press hard against the floorboard. I put my elbow on the door handle, my head on my hand, and watched the town. Kenner's 5 and 10, Walker's Hardware, Jarrett's Bakery, Schaefer's Barbershop, the bank. Dick Green and Carl Stacy waved. It was a boy. We drove back to school. You gonna coach tonight? Yes. Mom's okay? Yes, she's fine. Sad, but fine. She said for you to grab a sandwich after school. I'll see you at the game. Don't forget about your hair. I got out, walked in late to class. We're doing geography, Mrs. Wilson said, page 97, The Prairie. That night in bed, I watched this kid firing in jump shots from everywhere in the court. He'd cut left. I'd feed him a fine pass, and he'd hit. I'd dribble down the side, spot him in the corner, thread the ball through a crowd to his soft hands, and he'd loft a star up into the lights where it would pause, then gently drop, fall through the cheers and through the net. The game never ended. I fell into sleep. My hair was short. We were eight and two. That was my brother, a star from uh, the newer book, St. Peter and the Goldfinch. Yeah. um, You know, I never realized until uh i think it was the poet gary gildner said you know that's when your consciousness shift to being a poet Hmm. because you survived through your imagination at the end of that poem yeah yeah that's a great way to put it um i was going to ask um what 
you know, you mentioned that, that you were sort of given a challenge to write poetry and you came back like two years later, I think you said with a poem. Yeah. Um, do you remember what that poem was and what, what it was about? And, and what was it that you learned in those two years um, where you made it work? What I learned was how everybody else wrote poems. <laughs> Um, the poet Paul Zimmer was rather a Zen master with me because I think what he was pushing me toward was to have the courage to write my own poem. And he would invariably look at the poem and say, uh, yeah, this is, this is a fine poem. Uh, uh, have you been uh, reading uh, uh, Robert Bly lately? <laughs> and uh, I'd go, yeah, how'd you know that? <laughs> and, and so then... Uh, this one day, and the only thing, Tim, I can remember from that poem that he said was mine, when he finally said, you've written a poem, uh, was the first line, which was, Elizabeth made necklaces of brook trout. Hmm. <laughs> that was it. That's all I could remember. I keep looking for it. It's got to be in a file somewhere, right? <laughs> but I can't find it. Yeah. yeah. What, what was it about the poem um, that, that made it yours, do you think? Uh, was it, was there anything, there was a, a kind of breakthrough that happened? Cause I, I do think remember there... that for, for me, I had one poem where it was the first time I wrote something that I didn't know I knew. And, and that was sort of when I realized that, that poetry was, it was, you know, it's a sort of a science oriented person exploring the world, um, that, that, I, that there could be things that I don't know that I know was such a big breakthrough. And that's what made me love, you know, fall in love with poetry was that that could happen like as a key to to that understanding of yourself. Did, did that happen to you? That's what I always wonder when people mention stories I, like that. I, I, I think you're being a ventriloquist. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly right. Sure. Um, all the other things were recognizable. Um, and this poem had uh, my own. I guess it's a little pretentious, but my own vision um, and my own sort of quiet lyric, lyrical voice. And he spotted that right away. But also what I didn't know exactly. Yeah. I didn't know, you know, that there were you could make a necklace out of brook trout. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah. And, and, and that t t today it's the joy. This afternoon, that was the joy. Mm -hmm. uh, going, you know how you go down that page and you go down and you go, whoa, and uh, something shivers and shimmies and uh, and uh, you recognize that I didn't know I knew that. Yeah. Where did that, you know, <laughs> where did that come from? Well, it had to come from where else, you know, um, especially when I loved your description about the spirituality kind of thing of of the everyday, because uh, I've never been a fan of religion that takes us away from talking to Tim or petting my cat or walking my dog. Yeah, I mean, that's the, the sort of sense I get reading the poems is that, that life is, is spiritual, you know, and, yeah. and that, that every moment is something worth noticing and, and maybe describing or, or praising even or, or praying to. Uh, and and that's what the the poems feel to me like, um, especially the the you know, the more recent poems, um, which sort of tend to start with like noticing things. You know, they start with observations and then they spring into different directions. Yeah, yeah. I uh, I I think a lot of that has been a uh, uh, an evolution of recognizing that we don't really know anything and yet our educational system leads us to think we can master and we can know but uh you know just because you uh, uh my constant example if anybody's watching this who's heard me say this is okay you put a seed in the ground you plant it you get it and you do it just right and water it and the sun comes up and up comes a flower but does that explain it no of course not. It's and once you recognize that sense of the unknowable, then that's where you live. That's where you live. 
Uh, we we uh, we talked about your dad being the basketball coach, um, but your mother your, your mother's family has a circus background, which is really interesting. Um, I've I've never met anybody with that kind of background before. So so can you say more about that? Just it was one note in the vi- in the bio that uh, yeah. I just I'd love to hear more about. Did you okay? Did you do that growing up, or was it how? What was your relationship yeah. with that? Mostly as a, as a really little kid growing up, my mom was uh, pretty much raised with a cousin. So it was as if she was, that was her brother. And he became a circus man. And when I was born and at a certain point, when I was old enough, he would take me on the road to all these different circuses. So what I, <laughs> I, I, I often tell people, I always grew up backstage. I, in the circus, I was always in the back lot while everybody else was out watching the show because I'd already seen the show, okay? So what was interesting was the way these people lived. And of course, in my father's world, I was always in the, around the locker room with the players and behind the scenes with the sports writers and all that stuff. So everything, uh, and the other thing that I, I like to say is because I grew up in the, the, the sports world and the circus world, um, I uh, never developed a sense of reality. <laughs> it was just... Always these two crazy things, bouncing a ball and and uh, and and uh, watching people uh, walk on high wires. You know, it wasn't until I was uh, much older that I realized, you know, what's really amazing about the circus? These are adults. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's kind of Just what I was thinking. Who does that? Yeah. Right. I, I was kind of thinking about the, the parallels between poetry and the circus. And and that was mm. one of the sort of thoughts that came into my head is like, hey, we're adults, do we? <laughs> That's right. Uh, but, but also, um, there, there's a sense that like, um, you know, you're you mentioned being like in the in the back room behind the curtain, you know. And on a and a, I think about that a lot with a broadcast like this because most of the readers or most of the listeners, pretty much the whole audience, are poets too, who sure. are we're just it's sort of a weird performance that's entirely behind the curtain. You know, yeah. because we're all the circus performers, too. And we're most interested in, in seeing things behind the, on the, you know, behind the curtain. And uh, and that's and how poetry is. Yeah. yeah. You walk a wire. <laughs> yeah. 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 That, too. Um, I so love it's, that. Tim, I love that. I think that's very, very true. Yeah. Um, um, well, uh, if anyone has any questions for Jack, I should say, um, leave them in the chat windows on either YouTube or Facebook. I'm, I'm keeping an eye out for any questions, and I can pass them along. Uh, but let's hear another poem. I want to make sure we get to a good number of them, too, because I just love okay, your work. Okay, sure. Well, let's do one of those uh, uh, spiritual ones we're ta- yeah. we talked about. Uh, let's go to, uh, I have it down here. Let's go to page 29 um, in the Goldfinch. I think this would be a good example of what we're talking about. I hope I hope it is. The the title is Turning to the Psalter. It's a quiet morning, time for matins, the sun sending its preface through the maple's leaves. My God is here, sitting beside me on the porch. We're waiting for the day's new full light. My God, of course, is not very well known in eschatological circles. I call my God, God, with a capital G. Just as I do each morning, God also watches what comes into the space the eye creates. We do this throughout the day, glancing out a window or on the way to whatever is on the list. I like being religious in this unimportant way. Just me and God, worshiping by watching. God's glad we can sit here or rake leaves or clean the basement or listen to lead belly. Yesterday, I removed a dear friend from the Rolodex. There in blue ink was his name and his late wife's and his address for the past 11 years. They will be staying here now. I took a bit of time and looked at their names and the grace of the record, 34 years sending, receiving non-obligated holiday cards. Before tossing the worn down address into the recycle bin, I showed it to God, who nodded, took it, smiled, 
then led me outside to the back door where God knelt and set it on the first step. I was turning to the Psalter. And uh, let's talk a little bit about that. Um, okay. Just how the poem is written and, and where that, because I do feel like there's such a spirituality to this. And, and it's, that, it's that undiscovered territory that, that does that, I think. And, and here you have this turn in the poem where um, all of a sudden, you know, talking about other things, all of a sudden you say, yesterday I removed a dear friend from the Rolodex. Do you remember uh, where that line came from? And, um, like, did you know you were going to write a poem about that topic? Um, or were you sort of spinning your wheels at the time, not knowing what you were writing about, and then realizing? How did, how did, do you, if do you remember how that poem came to be? Yeah, I, I, I knew I wanted to write that poem, and uh, it begins with God as a small g, and then I name him God with a big g. Um, and, and I knew I sort of wanted to, uh, offhandedly get even with those who confuse theology with uh, spiritual uh, approach. And so he's not well known in eschatological circles. Um, but that line yesterday, I'll tell you, floored me. That that just showed up. I, mm -hmm. I never understand that, but I always hope that happens for uh, anybody who writes a poem, whether the poem's successful or not, that they have this experience of something led to that showing up. Um, now, the the card is the uh, was the address of the poet Conrad Hilberry. Maybe Con and I had uh, enough in common that that triggered it. Mm -hmm. I. I don't know. I'm just grateful. You know, it's one of those where haven't you done that where you you just want to pause and say thank you. I don't know who <laughs> sent that to me, but thank you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's like the other voice in your head or something. I mean, I, a lot of times I think of it as the right brain versus the left brain, because the right brain doesn't have it has more of a holistic connection to the world, but doesn't have access to to language. But every once in a while, it sort of punches through and says, hey, dummy, this is what we're talking about, you know? <laughs> right. Um, but then at the same time, it's also sort of the voice of God, too. I mean, it, it, you know, the way sure. that, that humanity came to be and, and spirituality came to be, it's sort of like the same thing, you know, because God oh, yeah. being in us and I don't know, it's such a strange thing. And then the whole concept of like the logos and naming things how important yeah. that is to, to their existence. Um, I, I think I read that you have a, um, uh, you studied religion as a major at first, right? Yeah, I did. I was, uh, uh, it's a nice and quick story. I was a pre-seminary student when I started out, and my advisor was also uh, my contemporary theology prof, and he was my, and he called me into his office one day, and, and he said, don't go to seminary. And he just changed my life with that. Um, he said, uh, I think you want to be a minister, but you have a very narrow definition of what that is. And I think you should, sure, graduate, get out of here and go be a minister. <laughs> but don't go to seminary because you, you, it, it's going to reduce. You, you have a bigger, wider, whatever you want to call it, a holistic sense of, of things. And... Um, they're just going to narrow it down. And yeah, that's interesting because that's sort of the opposite of the, the myths or the, the rumors I've heard about seminary school. There, I've, I've heard that there's this, uh, like when you go there, you, you, people tend to be expecting that it's very like doctrine based. And it ends up being about the unknowable nature of in the, in the different authors of the Bible and things like that. And it kind of ruins your certainty. And so there's this word for it. I can't remember the phrase, but it's some kind of um, like freak out that seminary students have in their first year. Um, but, but it sounds like you already had that. <laughs> yeah, that's that's right. I already had that. And um, actually, uh, I think my experience would be a little bit different today uh, or a lot different. I think what you've described would happen in many a seminary. Now, my background was very literal, very narrow, and I was be heading to a very narrow seminary. Mm -hmm. In fact, the uh, end result of that was everything shattered 
and I ended up uh, in a in a psych ward for a long time. Oh wow, uh, really? That what well, there's poems in the in the Goldfinch about that. Is like one is called "After the Thirteenth Shock Treatment." Mm-hmm. Uh, so I was back when everything was kind of primitive psychologically, you know, psychiatrically then, and uh, I came from a very primitive uh, religious background as well. Mm-hmm. really all but culted really actually yeah. so you know yeah when you say they freak out uh, my freak out happened when actually when that theology prof said uh-uh oh wow you know? yeah wow so so you know so your like foundation was sort of shattered at that point oh yeah and, and then yeah. how did you how did you pick up the pieces like what because you still have this spiritual sense going on but it's a different kind of spirituality yeah. uh, so very... so how did you how did you manage to put that together you said 13 years uh, oh it took uh no I, the, the 13 was shock treatment oh the 13 first... yeah then i'd actually was hospitalized uh psychiatric ward hospitalized five times mm-hmm. uh, but I haven't been for about 38 years, and I, in um, probably 90 some percent of that, I owe to my wife Julie. I have leftover PTSD from it, but not 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 as bad as it was at mm-hmm. one time. And I have, I'm I'm sure I'm not going back. <laughs> yeah. Do, <laughs> no, do you think that 38 years? I think I. In fact, that's a sort of a cause is mental health for me because I like to say to people, Hey, I made it. Come on. Mm-hmm. If I can, help you, let me help you. You know? Yeah. Yeah. That, that's really interesting. Um, I'm always interested in the way that poetry, um, poetry is healing. Um, oh, in yeah. the way that, that, that it helps construct the sort of meeting architecture that undergirds your life or something. Um, yeah. would you think that poetry was, was part of the way to, to put the pieces together? Yeah, I do. Um, it, and this may sound, I was on a panel once about healing. Does poetry heal? And everybody on the panel said no. Hmm. And I said, I understand what you mean. It doesn't heal cancer. All right. Um, however, it does. It can heal the inability to suffer. <laughs> um, and that's what it did. That's really so much of what it did for me is I started reading difficult poems, poems about trauma, poems that were uh, heartbreaking. And I slowly build up the ability to do that, to read those. So uh, I owe a lot to that. Uh, I remember spending time with Ellen Bryant Voigt. She'd come to the college for three weeks. And she, somebody asked her, is poetry therapy? And she was very fierce about it. She said, no, it's health. This culture needs the arts. It would be healthy if this culture understood the arts are for everyone and uh, the pro- the process of doing them is what's crucial. Mm. If we lived in a, uh, uh, a, a culture where everybody made pots, everybody danced, everybody sang, everybody chanted, we'd be a lot healthier, but we professionalized them, mm. you know? Yeah. And, and uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. Um, and that's really why that we do what we do. I think that everybody should be a poet because I think, um, you know, writing creatively about your experience um, gives gives grounding and, and meaning, like I said. And there's there's even research on it. I, that's why I talk, you know, when you talk to people and, and they say that poetry isn't a, an avenue of healing, I'm kind of taken aback by that all the time because it's actually, I mean, it's scientifically proven that James Pennebaker, who we talk about um, on the show occasionally, um, you know, he's he's shown in studies that people who are writing about um, and sort of contextualizing their their traumatic experiences and, and their traumas and their stresses end up physically better, you know, six and eight months later. And, uh, yeah. you know, and, and, and levels that, you know, you can measure, um, you know, stress levels and things like that that can be, you know, physically measured. Yeah. So, uh, so I think I've it's really wa- important. I've watched it in all my uh all my uh, years of working with people, you know, that, uh, and no matter what the age, I've seen it. So, yeah, you know, and uh, I, I always was careful and, and would say uh, to the students, especially the college students, are you ready? Now, the, oh, the people post 40 that I work with now um, are ready. You know, they're ready. They just go, boom, right for it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I would 
to make sure that the student was ready. And uh, But I had colleagues who didn't understand the value of that. They would look at the poem and say, I think I mentioned to you one colleague looked at a, one of my students' poems and said to me, are you teaching this kind of stuff? Well, this poem isn't any good. It's not good. It's not a good poem. You're supposed to teach good poems. And I said, do you know the value of it? And he was just, you know, walked away. Just walked away. Yeah, I, th so, I think I, uh, I think I read that you don't. You gave all A's for uh, for. Oh a, yeah. How long did you get away with that? <laughs> oh, I got away with that a lot. <laughs> I got away with that the whole time. Um, in fact, the faculty, a, a group of faculty, found out about this, and they came to me, and they said, "We understand you have no academic standards." Well, I didn't expect that. I was taken aback, and and I. I don't know where this came from either, Tim, but I said, you know, I think you're right. I think my standards are much higher than that. <laughs> and again, thank you for bringing me that line, you know. <laughs> but do you know the reason that I gave all A's was I noticed the first, very first time I taught poetry writing that every time I'd say, look what happens if you take this line and move it up here. I could tell what was going on in the student's mind was my grade just went down. Hmm. And as soon as I took it away and said, look what happens when this line, we move it up here. They went, oh, my gosh, that's great. That's just so cool. <laughs> what a difference. Yeah. What a difference. And then they just wanted more, you know, more, more, more. It wasn't criticism anymore. It was coaching. Mm -hmm. It was my dad. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. a great way to look at it. I mean... You know, as a teacher, you do like you're you're trying to get students to pass tests and things like that. But as a coach, you're trying to get the team to be the best, each player to be the best contributor to the team as possible. And and so as a teacher, you're being a coach for team poetry, right? And and just trying to That's make them the most, the, the best poets right. that you can. And everybody gets to play. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Everybody. You go on in. Everybody's on the court. Sure. Sure. Uh, yeah. In fact, that was a philosophy of my father. I picked that up. I knew I recognized it later on, but um, he would always work with each player. Okay, here's what I can see that you can do really well. Let's work on that. Here's what would help that a little bit. Let's work on that. So it was always uh, every student in the class was writing a different poem. They were writing their poem. I beat Paul Zimmer. I got them writing. Their poem right away. They didn't have to wait two and a half years before they wrote their own poem. <laughs> well, uh, let's hear another one, Jack. What do you want to read next? Okay, let's see. Um, how about, uh, oh, everybody write, we, we have to write these love poems, you know. Um, so this is in, uh, this is in Practicing the Walk Like a Heron. And it's on, it's Practicing the Walk Like a Heron on page 65. Um, a poem called Take Love for Granted. Sometimes it's fun. Don't you have fun uh, taking what the assumption is and then flipping it and seeing what happens? You know, that's fun, too. Take love for granted. Assume it's in the kitchen, under the couch, high in the pine tree out back, behind the paint cans in the garage. Don't try proving your love is bigger than the Grand Canyon, the Milky Way, the urban sprawl of L.A. Take it for granted. Take it out with the garbage. Bring it in with the takeout. Take it for a walk with the dog. Wake it every day. Say, good morning. Then make the coffee. Warm the cups. Don't expect much of the day. Be glad when you make it back to bed. Be glad he threw out that box of old hats. Be glad she leaves her shoes in the hall. Snow will come, spring will show up, summer will be humid, the leaves will fall in the fall. That's more than you need. We can love anybody, even everybody. But you can love the silence, sighing and saying to yourself, eh, that's her, that's him. And then to each other, I know. Let's go out for breakfast. 
<laughs> great love poem from uh, practicing to walk like a heron. Take love for granted. Thanks for sharing that, uh, Jack. Yeah. Uh, to, to stay on the, uh, the path of uh, talking about teaching poetry and things, uh, one of the things when I was looking up more about you, uh, I saw a TED Talk that you did on, ah. um, on the uh, uh, perfectly imperfect. Yeah, yeah. and, um, and, and I, you said, uh, the only thing Americans don't give up that they aren't good at is golf. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and it reminded me, I read this uh, expression uh, that I just, I'd never heard before, fairly recently. There was just, um, if, if there's anything worth doing, it's worth doing badly. And um, yeah. I love that idea. Um, and do you want to talk just a little bit about that, about what, you know, the, the, the problem with trying to be perfect, um, as far as like anything you're doing in life, um, but, but as, as far as a poet is too. Well, um, I wouldn't be surprised if I went back over all my years, which are 50 some, of uh, working with people that the idea of perfect is what's the, uh, the thing that, that held up more people than anything else, you know. Um, and sometimes they knew it. Often they would say, I'm a perfectionist and I just can't get, you know, and it stops me and I and I know my poem isn't this, and I know my, that's how they would talk. And the uh, way I would start the intro class, when they brought their first poem in, I would say, pick one student, hey, Jane, um, tell us, what was it like to write that poem? And uh, invariably, Jane would say, oh, I couldn't do it right, and I couldn't think, and I said, no, what was it like to write that poem? And she said, oh, I, I, I couldn't come up with an ending and it's just not, there's something wrong. And I said, what was it like for you to write that poem? And she'd say, oh, I found out how much I really loved my grandmother. Mm. And I go, that's it. Okay. Let's always, always keep our eye on that. Let's stay there. Because even if the poem is, uh, not perfect, which it can't be. Um, it will be perfectly imperfect if it's if it matters, and that's 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 pretty much how it started, uh, along with the story in that TED talk of uh, our daughter when I sprung the lights around the door and they, they went up this way and over this way, but only about halfway down the other side. And I said, "Oh, I screwed up," and she said, "No, they're perfectly imperfect. They're charming. They're wonderful." And more people commented on those Christmas lights <laughs> than, you know, if they'd have been, well, of course, they just assumed they would be parallel. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I just find that that struggle with trying to be perfect uh, with the poem is, I, I used to say this silly thing, too, to the students. I'd say, you know, Leonardo da Vinci doesn't know if the Mona Lisa is finished. You know it's a masterpiece, but he doesn't know that. He, he might have wanted added an earring or something, you know. I don't know. <laughs> How do you know? I don't know. It's art. Uncertainty. You better learn uncertainty fast if you're going to uh, work in the arts, and that's part of the joy. Yeah, yeah. There's a weird thing, too, where, um, like like with those the Christmas light story, where you sort of have to have it not be perfect in order to be appreciated. There's a weird way that, that you know, like if you, if you picked up an issue of Rattle Magazine and every poem knocked your socks off, right? Somehow yeah. it would lose its like, you know, you have to have some that don't work for you. <laughs> you know, yeah. and, and there's a, I don't know what it is. I mean, like there's some weird way that we, um, like, like we need more variety than perfection, you know? Oh, and, that's and, like and, and there's this uh, there's this concept um, in and I think data like information technology where like noise adds to um, the clarity actually which is really strange um, but there's a way that that works too uh, whether you're making art or whatever like it's the it's the lack of flawlessness somehow that I don't know there's just some magic or mystery to that that's right I, I, and and I, I I would often ask the beginning students. How many of you have written a sonnet? And they'd all put their hand up, you know, from high school. Did you write a sonnet? Yes. And I'd say, did any of you write a poem? <laughs> <laughs> and 
because there it is, you know. Perfect. And uh, I was reading the other day out of Ten Windows by Jane Hirschfield, and she the chapter about Basho, and she was talking about one time he just was fed up with this whole syllabic five seven five, and he just yelled, "Put nine in there." <laughs> And, you know, there's just, yeah, you can get hidebound about that stuff pretty fast. And and then you miss something that's maybe more magical than you ever expected. You know? Yeah. yeah. Um, so one of the things that, that's interesting is that you just have, you've had 85 of your students, probably even more since you wrote that in yeah, your bio. 90, 95 we'll, now. We'll bump it again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, is there anything that you can sort of recognize in a student early on that you know that they'll continue and, and be publishing and, and make it a part of, you know, be a successful writer? Um, is there something that you can see? There's a couple of things for me. Um, and I always would, uh, when I recognized it, I would ask the student to come up and I'd say, <laughs> you have it. And then I'd say, I, I'm not going to explain anything more than that. You just keep going. OK, but what that it was invariably for me was uh, an ability to to um, uh, change, to write something that changed your perception. Of, oh, I never looked at I've never seen it that way. I've never experienced that way. They might be able to describe, but the description was one that you'd recognize. Suddenly there becomes. Uh, a necklace of brook trout <laughs> and um, whoa, I've never thought of that before. Okay. Um, the other one was uh, whether or not they had a kind of had an ear, a, a, a sense of not, you know, they've been taught in high school very often that uh, sound meant rhyme instead of sound meant everything, mm -hmm. every single thing in the poem. I had a guy, interviewed me on the radio once who said, none of your poems are poems. And I said, oh, boy, have I wasted my life. And, and he, I said, why? And he said, well, none of them rhyme. And I said, oh, yeah, they all rhyme. In fact, not only do they all rhyme, every word rhymes with every other word. They all rhyme. The whole thing rhymes. And then he quickly got his next guest on, I think, <laughs> is what happened. But that would be number two. And number three, I could tell if, if, if they could uh, mimic or tell a joke. Hmm. Because if they could tell a joke, they could, they could do the one thing that I couldn't teach them, and that was timing. Mm -hmm. If they can't tell a joke, you know, I would look for time. And maybe it wasn't a joke. Maybe it was just when they spoke in class or something. You know, you could just tell their timing was exquisite. And so then we could build from those three things, you know, the way of perceiving, the musicality of language, and timing. Uh, say more about the, the, the timing, because it's always interesting how much poetry and humor has in common. It, it seems oh, like a my. strange mystery to me. Um, but, but there is that sense of, I mean, because a, a joke, you know, has a turn in it, too, that undercuts yeah. what you expect in the same way a poem does. So, like, the structure is the same. And because of that, the need for timing is the same, and uh, and you're good at, at jokes too. So um, so so how do you how do you think about the two together? Oh, all the time. I uh, I think they they are uh, a lot of the stand-ups are you know wonderful poets, both with all those things. You know, they know how to do a cadence when they deliver. They know how to perceive something that we'd not maybe see. And then they have this exquisite sense of, of timing where it'll fall flat. And uh, you're one of the few people that's ever uh, coordinated those two uh, uh, that I've talked with. That's just that is very refreshing to hear. I had one creative writing course in my whole life. And the professor came in the first day and said, here's my grading system. If you can make me think, you'll get a C. If you can make me feel something, you'll get a B. But if you could make me laugh. You'll get an A. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the uh, thing he said. <laughs> yeah, that, that's what we always say too. Is that if a poem makes us laugh or cry, then we publish it for sure. And yeah, um, and sure. so how what we publish in the issues? I, I, I Megan reads them and I read them. And then we take what we like to Alan, who's a, the, the founder of Rattle. And right. um, I'll give him a funny poem. I'll try not to give him any like sort of suggestion that it's funny. 
and I'm sort of watching, waiting. And if he he has this great laugh, and if he like throws his head back and laughs, I'm like, yes, you know, that's like what I'm trying to do. Um, but there, it's tough in poetry, though. It's it's much yeah, it, harder without the um, you know without the the, the timing you mentioned, um, you know, to do that in a poem. And, um, you know, it's so flat on the page versus oh, yeah. you know, all the nonverbal cues that we have as a stand-up comic. Um, yeah. Do you think about that? Because some of the poems have a lot of moments of humor in them. Do you think about that while, while you're writing, oh. how to make it funny on the page? And do you have any yeah. advice for people who are trying to do that? Yeah, usually in terms, I suppose with poetry, it's more of the uh, taking advantage of incongruity. Like there's a poem that uh, has the title something like uh, on learning that the editor of a magazine uh, expects the first line of a poem to be a grabber. And then I start the poem with call me Ishmael. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And, um, and then there's, there's one uh, called uh, a yoga poem called guided meditation. And uh, partway through it's it, the uh, chanter, the person leading them in the meditation asks them to uh, uh, imagine a field of lotus flowers. Or if you're from the Midwest, imagine corn, you know, like that. (laughs) So that you're, um, uh, yeah, so that, you know, you're juxtaposing incongruity. It doesn't belong, and that's why it does belong. Mm -hmm. Think that way. It's fun. Yeah. Yeah to think that way and i think even and that you know the that poem take love for granted man that's really close to just being silly and Mm -hmm. funny you know it just kind of tiptoes on that high wire again you know uh and and isn't that the fun for you too i mean yeah, yeah, it definitely is. It, it's that it like a high wire act, like you used that metaphor before, um, and it kind of is. It's like like are you going to keep this up? And and there's a sense of play too. Like you're you're Very playing much. with your your own mind while you're writing a poem, and that's part of the delight of reading one. Yeah, um, I'll read one that really ends up being a, a protest poem. It's in the Goldfinch too. It's on page fifty. Yeah, just to let you know, I was going to say, uh, we have room for about two more poems. So uh, okay. this one, then one yeah. more. Well, let's, let's, hear, uh, let's hear this one because it illustrates a little bit um, taking the serious and flipping it. Okay. Uh, heaven. In which page? Oh, 50. Okay, thanks. Oh, wait. You got it? Yep, I got it. All set. Okay. Heaven. Groucho guards the gate, more bewildering than God in judging supplicants. Behind him, Harpo, his hair reason enough to realize there's nothing we can do. Say the sacred word. Logos, we shout. Groucho taps his long cigar. What? He laughs. Logos? What the hell is Logos? We are terrified. We look to Harpo. He smiles, shrugs, honks his horn, pulls some celery from his coat and gnaws. Groucho lights a new cigar, arcs his eyebrows, moving the clouds of heaven higher, then looks so sadly at us that we ache to know what we have done. Groucho turns his back, catches sight of a slithery blonde and slinks his way away, healing the sullen, turning loaves and fishes into parakeets and somehow dragging us through into the madness of eternity. Mm. That was a uh, heaven from uh, the newer book, St. Peter and the Goldfinch. Yep. Um, love the cover too. And that's your daughter that did the cover. Is that what I read? Yeah. She's, uh, I'm very lucky. She's gotten to do the cover for uh, broken symmetry and t- St. Peter and uh, practicing to walk like a herring. Yeah. And there, there's, I'll, I'll put the covers up there. This is broken symmetry. Pardon? Yeah. I, I'm just putting up the covers so people at home can, mm, can mm. see your daughter's work. Good. Yeah. You know, you buy that book for about 15 bucks and that painting goes for about two grand. So you (laughs) cover off, put a little frame around it and uh, it's worth your 15 bucks. (laughs) Perfect. That's a great suggestion for everybody at home. Um, (laughs) uh, When we were talking about your students and and how many were successful, one of the things I was thinking about, too, is the way that um, that you need to stick with it. 
you know, is there a sense that poets, because that's always one of my fears just as an editor. I mean, I've been doing this for over 17 years now. Wow. And I see some great writers sort of drop out and sort of get bored maybe with the, the, the system of publishing or just with poetry itself or, um, you know, and so one of the, in addition to those, I think, three elements you mentioned, one of them seems to be like just the, the drive to stick with it and not give up or not get bored or not get frustrated. Um, can you, yeah. I mean, you've been writing for a long time successfully. Um, do you have any advice or thoughts on that? Like, how, how do you keep at it? Well, two things uh, come to mind, and I'm sure others have many more. Um, one is that if you stay with it long enough, uh, I think it becomes the way you perceive, the way you see I, I work with a former philosophy professor, and the reason I work with him every Tuesday, actually, um, is because he wants his mind to change from philosophy to poetry, hmm. believe it or not. That's what he wants. Um, so sometimes it just stays there. It stayed there for me. I think the other one sort of comes from Henry Moore when he was asked, how, does he keep, how did he keep doing those sculptures? And he said, endurance. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> endurance yeah. yeah and maybe it's the coach's kid in me i can't quit you know coaches kids can't quit they're yeah, not there, allowed to. there's that thing about it. i mean i mean how many free throws did michael jordan shoot you know back in his in his you know court by yeah. his house when he was a kid i mean that's 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 a really big part of it is that drive to keep going at it even in the face of uh frustration and how I don't know. I mean, with poetry, it's a sort of a different thing because you get to feel, I don't know, maybe maybe it's not, though, because it feels kind of pointless sometimes, right? Because there's so few readers oh, yeah. compared to other art forms. But oh, then at goodness. the same time, I mean, is uh, is basketball pointless? You know, I mean, what is point? You know what I mean? Like, like I'm shooting a ball in a hoop. <laughs> Great story. You just quoted my dad. Yeah. Because Sports Illustrated came and wrote a story about it, Okay. So partway through the week, the reporter said to him, you know what's weird? You're this coach that we're going to write this story on in Sports Illustrated, but your kid's a poet. That is really weird. And my father said, Curry, his name was Curry Kirkpatrick. He said, Curry, you know what? You're just not familiar with it. He said, you know what I do? I dress guys up in these little shorts and these outfits, and they bounce the ball and they try to put it through a ring. And then they try to stop these other guys from putting it through a ring. That's what they do. And you come and you're writing a story about people who do that. Now, isn't that wonderful? I mean, it's like the, the definition of surrealism, you know, making the familiar strange again. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, but, I mean, was I lucky or what to have him say that? Oh, yeah. my God. I mean, really, I mean, we, uh, you know, we, we love basketball. We watch basketball. I mean, I love playing basketball. Did as a kid. Still do now. The, the one thing that's heartbreaking to me is that there's no more pickup basketball in our town because the person who oh. ran it moved away. Um, but, no. but, but you do it because you love playing. And you write poetry because mm -hmm. you love playing. And, and there's oh, different yeah. things that, that it's doing for you and your mind and body. And um, it's really not any more bizarre. But there's this weird sort of... I don't know, self-loathing or something that poets tend to have, you know, because they don't get the the notoriety of like, you know, someone who's writing for uh, X-Men comics or whatever, you know. My wife is laughing. She's nodding. <laughs> she knows how many times she's had to deal with, oh, I've wasted my life. Yeah. You know? <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. And yet this afternoon when I was writing that poem or whatever I was doing, and this poem was appearing, huh? Um, I just thought this is the w most wonderful place to be inside this. Ah, I'm so lucky. Yeah. And then after I set it down, I went, I've wasted my life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The old uh, Duffy's farm. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Um, well, uh, we're just about out of time. Let me ask one more question. Um, just because everybody always loves to hear what, what poets uh, do you recommend reading right now? Like what are you reading and, and you're enjoying? What's the, what's the, the, the book that most recently knocked your socks off by someone else? Ah, boy, that's a, uh, it's a book called Shimmer by a poet, Robert Haidt. Um, boy, that's tough for me. Cause I'm, you know, forgive me all my friends that I leave you out. <laughs> uh, a tiny journalist, Naomi Nye's uh, 
Yeah, that was great. She was on Rattlecast well, uh, number like twenty four yeah. or something. Yeah, right. That's a great yeah. book. Yeah, that one uh I think was really, really important. Um uh Terrence Hayes's book, I can't remember what's the name. Um uh, the, the sonnets. Uh, yeah, the sonnets. Mm -hmm. Um gee, it's hard. I pick up an anthology a lot. J James Cruz has done it's been interesting to me to see uh, you know, like Ted Lasso is so popular. There's something happening with some group of poets that is uh, that's writing about how to love the world. Hmm. And um, there's a there's I've been discovering them. You know, they maybe it's like Jane Kenyon's comeback or something. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, I think it's a really important thing to be doing right now too, because there's such uh, such misanthropy going on. Yeah. It's sort of the central tenet of of our current, you know, generation yeah. or, or way yep. of looking at the world. That was cool. And uh, James Cruz, these people are doing these uh, poetry of presence. Uh, James's is how to love the world. I think that's the title of uh, the anthology that he's put together. But mm -hmm. those poems have ended up uh, really showing up, you know, and for a long time, the woe is me is, was, pretty much it yeah. uh you know held forth anyway uh you you were you were uh, i've always been disappointed that, that bad press sentimental gets because you know where dickens good heaven shakespeare was over the top sentimental <laughs> i think um and certainly dickens i mean sentimental is what you should dare richard hugo said that i mm -hmm. didn't say that but he said dare the sentimental dare it yeah, yeah. I think that was really good advice. Uh, do you want to finish out with one last poem? We're up on time. Sure. I'd be glad to. Um, let's do... Um, uh, where did it go? On, uh, in uh, Practicing to Walk Like a Heron, a short poem. Let's do that okay. on page 156. 156. Uh, the title is After Spending the Morning Baking Bread. Our cat lies across the stove's front burners, right leg hanging over the oven door. He is looking into the pantry where his bowl sits full on the counter. His smaller dish, the one for his splash of cream, sits empty. Say yes to wanting to be this cat. Say yes to wanting to lie across the leftover warmth, letting it rise into your soft belly, spreading into every twitch of whisker, twist of fur and cell, through the Mobius strip of your bloodstream. You won't know you will die. You won't know the mice did not exist for you. If a lap is empty and warm, you will land on it. Feel an unsteady hand along your back, fingers scratching behind your ear, and you will purr. Oh, that's a great poem to end on after spending the Thank morning baking bread. And for proof, you can't see it, but everybody at home can see the coffee stain in the corner of this book to prove that it's been, <laughs> been places with me. Um, it's a really great book, uh, Practicing to Walk Like a Heron, um, and, and your others, too. I always that message from you about that book, that... That's one I've saved always. Yeah, it, it was a it was a book that I really I sort of got a little cynical about poetry maybe for a little while, even though I'm a poetry editor, and then it kind of perked me up in a way that really was helpful. So I, I appreciate it, Jack. That's good. Um, so yeah, it's been a pleasure to talk to you and get to know you. Um, as these rattlecasts always are. Thanks for being a guest oh, and uh, and sharing your poems and your wisdom. It's been a real joy, and thanks for everybody who's been with us too. Yeah, my pleasure. Good night. Good night. And that was Jack Riddle um, sharing uh, three of his books. Let me put them on screen one more time. Um, his his older one is Broken Symmetry here. Does he use the same press all the time? Let's see. The uh, This is Wayne State. I think they are the same press. Wayne State University Press. And that was uh, the 2007 or so book, um, Broken Symmetry. And then uh, around 2012 or so, he is practicing to walk like a heron. And then uh, St. Peter and the Goldfinch. And these are all from Wayne State University Press. And you can find them on Jack's 
website. I think if you just type in riddle.com, R-I-D-L.com, it redirects to his WordPress. Yeah, so just type in riddle.com, R-I-D-L.com, and you'll get his website, um, all his books, uh, links to buy them, and um, and more from, from Jack Riddle. Great poet and great teacher. Uh, great human being, as you can tell. So, so glad to have him as a guest tonight. Now, we're going to take a brief break. I'm going to get the open line set up. Um, the prompt this week was um, was when the sun goes down at the county fair, and um, I did not finish my poem. I'm, I'm contemplating reading you my uh, unfinished poem, but uh, maybe I will. I don't know. I can't decide. It's not. It's not good, <laughs> but maybe I'll share it. But that's the prompt for this week. If you have any poems for the open lines, um, feel free to share them. If you have any news poems about current events, you can share them too. This is how it goes. Email your poems right now to open mic. That's open M I C at rattle.com. Um, so I have them on screen and I can show them like we were showing Jack's poems before as you read. And then pick one or the other, not both, because then I'll call you twice. But uh, either send me a chat message over Skype at rattle poetry, all one word. Um, and then I'll just wave or say hi or something. Say you want to read a poem. I'll, I'll acknowledge that you did that. And then we'll call you back when it's your turn. The other option is to do it by old-fashioned phone. And the number is 818-850-7727. Just uh, call, let it ring a few times, and hang up, and I'll give you a call back. And that's how we do the open lines here at Rattle. But first, right now, send your poem to openmic at rattle.com. So we're going to take a quick break. I'm going to get things set up for the open lines. And then uh, I'll be right back. And I'm back. Thanks for uh, your patience while I stand up and stretch a little bit and get these open lines ready. Um, so let's see. Over on the chat, uh, Vicky Miko says, please read it, Tim, which I was kind of fishing for you to make me say that. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's interesting to share maybe incomplete poems. So maybe, I'll, maybe I will share that. And um, we'll just share Megan's poem, too, of course. And now, once again, the prompt for this week was when the sun goes down at the county fair. And my poem, um, I, I the, the real problem, I didn't give myself enough time this week. Um, and so I'll show you what, what I, I, I was writing a villanelle. And um, I, I think I picked a bad second line rhyme, which was making me struggle more than I expected. And uh, I just ran out of time. So I'm missing the last tercet. And I'm not really happy. There's not really the, it, that's what needs to have like a turn there a little bit. Um, but anyway, this is, uh, this is mine, my failed poem or my incomplete poem being there. And I'm not a big fan of the, uh, county fairs or anything with a lot of people. I'm like, uh, I, I like one-on-one -on -one stuff. I like nature. I like sports. I don't really like big, uh, big festival -y things. So this is a villanelle I was kind of working on, but you'll see the end. It's just missing, <laughs> missing a tercet there. So, uh, and I don't think it's very good any, either way, but, uh, but the struggle is real. And so I will share my struggle with you. This is, uh, this is, uh, being there when the sun goes down at the county fair, all the brightest lights come out. It's almost worth your being there. Shadows dancing and the glare make rainbows. Look, the children shout when the sun goes down at the county fair. 
A perfume of candy fills the air between the wafts of sauerkraut. It's almost worth your being there. Sink a basket, win a pair. You're a winner without a doubt when the sun goes down at the county fair. Something, something, something. There's something about the, the, you know, the, the buskers shouting and something, I don't know. But it's almost worth your being there. This is a world without a care. Don't think you're sneaking out. When the sun goes down at the county fair, it's almost worth your being there. That was my, my you know, almost finished bad villanelle. So, um, you know, it doesn't work every week. But, uh, but I, I'll try. I'll try better next week. Um, and here is Megan's. And I haven't read this yet. We were both, honestly, we we're both sort of in uh, vacation mode. Because we're going to be taking a little little vacation, and um, we're kind of ready to go. <laughs> it's been a long time, so um, we, we kind of at the last minute wrote some poems here. This is Megan's at the county fair, and I haven't even seen this yet, but I'm sure it's good because everything Megan does is good, even if she says it's not. At the county fair, in the twilight, the haunted house with its painted banshees, canned moans, just looks sad. But we need to see beyond the front door's plastic bones. Though we know it will only be darkness, cheap Halloween warehouse decor, and it is, but there's something otherworldly about cardboard ghosts and ketchup gore. When the mechanical demons move, the creaking sounds they make are louder than their shrieks. We scream, that too is fake. The air smells of fried oil and sweat. The puppets rattle their tin chains, and the neon signs flash danger. When the soundtrack wanes, Spooky, scary sounds, volume 12. The carny says, well, that's the ride. And I look back at the tilting trailer and say, really scary, almost died. Outside, the earth is still rotating. There are dangers here, real, waiting. That was Megan's poem um, at the county fair. And of course, she always outcompetes me and manages to finish, even though we both started at the same time. Um, okay, so... Let's see what you all have. I did do a Saiku, so I have a Saiku for later, too, um, which is always a good way to end the show. But let's see who we have now. So the first person to ask on is Caitlin Buxbaum. And um, let us see. Let's call up Caitlin and see what uh, she has to share. Let's see. Oh, it's on Verse Virtual. Okay. So uh, here we go. Let's call up Caitlin right now. Hello. Hey, Caitlin. How you doing? Let me get, get you resized. There you go. Um, so how you doing? It's been a while. Yeah, I realized the last couple months I've, I've only been coming in like once a month, which is a bummer. Um, the time change has kind of thrown me. I haven't gotten used to that yet. The just... Sunday? Well, yeah. And also, you know, it starts at four o'clock here. So oh, that's right. it's like still afternoon and sunny outside and I want to go play. So, <laughs> <laughs> or I'm on my way back from somewhere, but yeah, I wonder if the, if the earlier time is better or later. So if anybody, people leave me some feedback, cause I could easily do it. I just think that on the East coast, they end up right. getting late. So it's really hard to judge. I think I'm too. We're going to do some um, in the morning again, which is even worse for you. <laughs> but uh, just well, so that people in uh, the UK and, and Europe and things can actually call in and stuff, because everybody, because people keep saying, "Oh, I'd love to join," but, uh, mm -hmm. but you know, it's three a.m. for me, and and we miss Spartacus. He hasn't been on in a while because yeah. it's so late there, and um, so for multiple reasons, I, I'm going to do a couple. But then the problem is mi mixing up times. People get confused too, so I don't know. I'm trying to right. juggle it and make it work as well as I can. But so I think that's actually more the issue for me is that we've had you've had a couple weird ones like mm -hmm. noon or like that one day the power went out yeah. and <laughs> had to do it like the next day, and uh -huh. so I said, "Oh, I didn't miss it! Hooray!" Yeah, but. Anyway, you'll figure it out. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. It, you know, just so so people give me feedback is all I'm saying. I'll I'll keep an eye out for what people think and try to try to make it work as best we can. But what did you want to share? This is from Verse Virtual, mm -hmm. I think, right? So what is it? Yes. So well, first of all, Verse Virtual I actually found through Billy Collins' wife. <laughs> oh really? Um, she posted about it on his page or something. Um, when and I when he was doing those regular broadcasts and I was watching those and. It's the goal of it, it. I mean, it's a literary magazine, but they really want to encourage 
commenting on the poem. So email the person and tell them, you know, what you liked about their poem. Hmm, um, so that's, that. it's a, it's nice. I like it. Um, so this one that I'm going to read was from the July issue. So this month, and it is a golden shovel using a line from Bob Hickok's poem that you published sort of recently, um, a braid of unknowing I tie before you. Ah, that's great. And I can't remember if that was a poet's respond poem or what, but, um, yeah, I think that was, I think that was after, what was that about though? I can't remember what that was about. I don't, (laughs) I don't either (laughs) actually. Um, but maybe we'll, I mean, it was kind of sciencey, but mm-hmm. I think all the science poems always kind of reach out and then end up being about something else too. Yeah. So maybe maybe we'll remember when I read it. <laughs> maybe after you, maybe after you, uh, I'll share Bob's poem, and then we can we can all remember. Yeah. It's, it's probably worth doing. But let, let's hear hear this golden okay. shovel. And for people that don't know uh, what a golden shovel is, this is a form uh, Terence Hayes invented, um, where you take a, a great line from another poet and then you make each word running down the poem the last words in the poem. And so uh, so in this one, the last words of each line will be, tell me something I don't know about the universe as you read down. So uh, That's actually not the case. No? <laughs> I cheated on this one Uh-oh. <laughs> because the epigraph is not the line that I used in the poem. Oh. I liked both lines so much, I made one the epigraph and a different one <laughs> well, well, tricky. The, the poem. <laughs> okay. But Throw here we go. Let's okay, let's it. go hear it. This is chaos theory. And the epigraph is, tell me something I don't know about the universe. What if is the true science of entropy, the unpredictability of all that is or could be? I wonder if we actually asked every question, had the patience to hear every possible answer in the span of our lifetimes, what disguise could truth dawn to hide from us? And what troubled aspect of tangled love could survive the war of knowing? Which is worse, feeling everything at once, or the absence of all feeling? I can only imagine the internal dynamics, the way a soul might battle itself with no means to rationalize emotional decision, to explain away a right or wrong. Perhaps this is why we are not gods, but a collection of atoms, patterned and sensitive, destined to cling to irregularities governed by breath, to contend with the ignorance of longing each moment of our existence, bound to the other. Ah, that's great. That's chaos theory. And then down the line, there are two quotes. Entropy is actually patience in disguise. And, and And then Caitlin uses the and in the poem, which is kind of, I've never seen that before. That's clever. Love is the only way to explain why atoms cling to each other. Yeah, very cool. Thanks for sharing that, Caitlin. Thanks for letting me. And before uh-huh. I forget, because I forgot last time, I'm having a virtual book launch for my first collection of fiction on August 31st on my Red Sweater Press YouTube channel. So awesome. Very if people cool. want to yeah, show up to check that. that out. I didn't know you did fiction too. Uh, you're just doing everything. That's actually where I started um, and took a long rabbit trail down the poetry mm-hmm. direction. So, um, yeah, it's a couple of short stories, and my friend from college illustrated it. So cool. I'm happy yeah. with it. Yeah, well, good luck with the book launch, and feel free to post it in the chat message or, or anywhere anywhere around. <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> okay, cool. Have a good night, Caitlin. Good to see you. Yeah, you too. Bye. Bye. Yeah, that was Caitlin Buxbaum, of course. Um, and let me find, let me find this poem. I can't remember if Bob read it or if I have to read it, uh, but we'll see. Oh yeah. So Bob, I've read the shy one and didn't include audio, so I have to read it. But, uh, (laughs) and we were wondering what it was about And in typical Bob, um, Bob Hickok fashion. He says it was about everything. (laughs) So, uh, so we'll see. Um, what, let, let, let's click on this link and see what everything meant. Ah, so it's uh, the Derek Chauvin murder trial. Um, okay, so that's what he was writing about. And this is Bob Hickok's poem, which uh, inspired Caitlin's golden shovel just now. A braid of unknowing I tie before you. Eight minutes, almost nine. I've been seeing a star to the east in the morning. 
It'll be hard not to give four or five students D's this semester. Are optimists fools? For eight minutes, almost nine, one man knelt on another man's neck. A star or planet, I don't know. Many have stopped turning in poems or coming to class, more than ever in my twenty years of teaching, during this third semester of COVID. Obviously, there are more problems and solutions, more shit than Sinola, Shinola. A white cop kneeling on a black man's neck. I've been meaning to ask the internet what the light is, so I can refer to it in the first person. Dear Vega, dear Saturn, when I'm grateful for company from so far away. They expected to be going to parties and football games, to be drinking and dropping acid, to be rubbing against space and time, but the friction of bodies and growing older into adults has been replaced by fear of breathing in the wrong place at the wrong time. To think we can change or get better at changing our oil or not clear-cutting forests or listening to opinions we don't hold or sharing our wealth is insane in an evidence-based system of analysis. If you look at the data, I remember back to five minutes ago when I scanned the headlines and Chicken Little was right. The sky is falling. How is it not murder? clearly and simply murder to kneel on a man's neck for eight minutes, almost nine. And what happens? What rot overtakes our hearts when we can't admit this? Can't white admit to black, old to young, sane to crazy world in which one man tries to justify kneeling on another man's neck after subdued, after compliant, after hearing him call for mama and say sixteen times that he can't breathe, that this is wrong, so obviously and clearly immoral that we'll stop from this cruelty in unison, and cast it in steel and touch it every day for the rest of our lives to remind ourselves of what we'll never do again. Dear Vega, dear Saturn, tell me something I don't know about the universe, that as it grows, we grow, that as light leaves us, more arrives, that entropy is actually patience in disguise, that love is the only way to explain why atoms cling to each other and something more than the zero exists. Is it kind to set aside their failures? what they haven't done or said, the stones they've channeled with their silences in class, and how do we ask something of each other, or give in ways that lift and teach? How can we lay this period of time on a blanket and wrap it, roll it in softness and concern, and make our way to the other side? Optimism is the source of karaoke, light bulbs, mosh pits, kissing and fucking in birth, and thinking a man's pointless death can have a point, can be a fulcrum or lever or both. How do you lift a world already afloat in space or convince people that we're surfers and gliders called to be animals of grace, that we cling to speed and grand motions and need each other to hang on? I am lost in every way except my certainty that the only true mirror is each and every other face. Eight minutes, almost nine. It'll be hard not to sit in an actual room with their actual eagerness to overcome gravity and time. Optimists are oceans and skies at heart. A star or planet touching me with light I want to deserve. So that was Bob Hickok from April 4th of this year with uh, a braid of no unknowing I tie before you. From Poets Respond. Another Poets Respond poem. Okay, let's see. Next up, we will call... Hmm. We will call uh, Joy Stahl next. And then we'll do um, AJH, who's a first time caller. We'll do Joy first, though. Hello. Hey, Joy. How are you doing tonight? All right. Um, so you have a county fair prop poem for us. Uh, is there anything you want to say yeah. about it before you read? Um, no. Okay, well, let me plop it into a Word doc really quick, and then uh, why don't you go ahead and read it whenever you are ready. Okay. i got to find it. Hang on one second. There we go. Let me make it bigger, too. There we go. Okay, go ahead whenever you're ready. All right. Friday night. I only noticed that the sun has gone down when the rodeo arena lights turn on. The Bulls and Bronx finish bucking off all of their riders. 
and the barrels are run. Here at the small county fair, the competitors are our neighbors or from nearby rural colleges. The rodeo announcer says the show is over and the crowd files out, but a few of us stay in the stands. Those of us who know to stay and watch the slack. At some rodeos, these rounds are held in the morning, but at our county fair, it is after the sun goes down that they pick up the slack. Which is not to say that these competitors are doing the work of others, running the rounds that no one else is entertained by, except for those of us who know to stay seated when the sun goes down at the county fair. I love that ending. Thanks so much for sharing. That was Friday night. Joy Stahl. Thank you. Yep. Have a good night. Me too. Okay, so that was Joy Stahl with Friday night. Um, you know, I don't know. I think I love the idea of a fair in my head. Like the visual. If people are in a movie walking through the fair, I like that. <laughs> okay. Um, and now let's call up, like I said, AJH. I'm not sure. Let's see. Um, she has a poem called Miss Mango County. And we'll see who this is. Hello. Hey. Um, oh, Miss Mango County. I found it. This is Alex Hines. Yes, indeed. Yeah, thanks so much for joining us. I don't have audio or visual if you want to turn on your camera, but you don't have to. I'm actually stuck at work at the moment, but was listening in and thought I would call in for once. Excellent. Well, I'm so glad you could. Um, so this poem is uh, Miss Mango County. Uh, is there anything you want to say about it? Um, yeah, so just real fast for a little background here. I work in West Virginia, and there is... Uh, you know, a lot of a lot of challenges that facing the state. So this is some of the things I've seen throughout my work. Cool. And, and let me ask, since you're at work, what is it that you do? Um, I actually work for a, I'm a journalist in the area. So ah. I'm out and about in many different parts of the area. V very interesting. Uh, maybe talk about that a little bit after you uh, read this poem, but let's share the poem. Absolutely. Just go ahead at this point. I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Miss Mingo County and her court greet the small but earnest crowd as she passes through the parade of friends and family stepping away from their lives for these few sweet hours. For a while, questions of dinner, not the substance, but the source, are firmly put in the backs of minds. Now it's Turtle Man and Jamie Lynn Spears and the garage bands from the next county over that fill the mental space allotted for focus. Tomorrow, Donnie up the road will figure out how to pay for that operation for Mom. Dreama will decide if the best thing for Davy is to tell those deputies about the meth. And Darla will once again try to buck up and tell Mom and Dad that really she is Douglas. But in the fading crepuscular light giving way to the glowing Ferris wheels and elated screams coming from the rickety scrambler that may or may not fly apart on its own grumpy whim, tonight the only thing in life is the corn dogs, gloopy nachos, and the best pepperoni rolls in five counties. Another great ending. I love that. And that was uh, Miss Mingo County, not Mango. Uh, yeah. Thanks for <laughs> uh, thanks for sharing that. And and what I'm wondering how does um how does poetry in your work as a newspaper reporter um, intersect? Because that's one of the topics I'm thinking about doing for a tribute to. I think we're, we're doing librarians, and then I think we might do um, reporters or, or journalists as a as a theme. Um, and and how do your uh, your colleagues think about writing poetry? Well, you know, it's I actually will work for a uh, TV station here uh -huh. in the area. So um, it's not something we get to do a lot of, as you might imagine. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually came to this today because I have known Jack for quite a little a lot of time. So when I saw he was coming on, I wanted to stop in and visit myself. But um, it, it's in my case, it's something that, you know, especially um, the way we work, we stay in certain areas the way we look at things and where we cover them and kind of how we determine who's covering what on a day and it's uh you kind of see you see some things as cliche as that sounds and it does stay with you mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Well, I'm so glad uh, you could do that. you could join us today and uh, and and keep looking out for that issue because we where we probably doing that next year something like that. I will certainly keep an eye out. Awesome. Thanks. Have a good night. You bet. Bye. So that was uh, Alex Hines with uh, Miss Mingo County. Thanks for sharing that, Alex. Um. Okay. Let's see. So, um, let's go next to another <laughs> journalist poet, uh, Angela Gartner. And uh, let's see what Angela has to share tonight. Hey, Tim. Hey, Angela. How are you doing this uh-huh. evening? Good. How are you? I was just about to say, I totally agree with him. <laughs> As a journalist, like, you do see things that stick with you and... You know, it is. Is there any um, like like taboo about writing about it later, or is, like like I mean, if you were a doctor, there's the HIPAA laws and things like that. Um, is there any um, do, you, do 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 journalists worry about writing creatively about the stuff they witness? I I think sometimes. I mean, I know I do. I I do hold some things back. You know, I think if it's like over the years, I, I wrote a poem recently about something that um, I saw and I was like, and then, e- but sometimes I even feel um, anxious when I write a poem that is something so serious that it, like, like, oh my gosh, I'm writing about this and it's like too real. And that's, that's, I feel like a little bit more anxious. So it definitely, I I think we hold things back, but, and it's hard for, you know, I, I just, you know, we have to tell the truth. (laughs) Obviously we have to report and and we have to be accurate. So I think sometimes in poetry, I want to be so accurate that it's hard to take a poetic license sometimes, you know, Mm -hmm. can't like, I I don't like to make stuff up. (laughs) It's not what I'm (laughs) on my job. Do, do you ever, is there a situation too where like truth is stranger than fiction? And like, if, if you were writing about it, people wouldn't believe it. Yeah, I, I think, I think so. And, you know, with some things it, it's, it's sadder than fiction though. Like, yeah. cause you know, it's true. And that's why it's hard to write about it sometimes, mm-hmm. you know, as, yeah. as a journalist, you've seen, you know, especially, you know, I used to be a newspaper reporter and, you know, some of the things that, and, and that's why it's so hard. And I'm such a news junkie and I'm still so involved that it's, it's hard for, it's hard for me, you know, to keep and, you know, but I love to share stories. It's, it's the best job in the world, honestly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> that's great. Um, so what poem did you want to share? Was it the wildfire poem? Yes, okay. it was. And, and so that you want to say about it or, um, well, I mean, I, Unlike you guys, I mean, I live in the Midwest, so the the wild wildfires isn't something we see a lot mm-hmm. in the Midwest. And but you know, this week, you know, everybody I know was talking about the haze. We had like this big haze over our um, area and and city that it was from the smoke from all the wildfires from Canada and California. And I think that you know. The smoke, what to me means, you know, everybody's so fast. Everybody was so fascinated with it. It's it's more like a fascination and an awe. But to me, like the smoke means that, you know, you know, trees are being destroyed, people's homes being destroyed, people being, you know, killed, and that is not good. You know, it, it's it's it's. It, it, but we don't see the actual flames that mm-hmm. you guys see. So it, it just made me think about um, this poem. What kind of made me think about, you know, that there's even though we don't see it, we still have to recognize that it's happening. Yeah. Yeah. We had a when we had to evacuate for a fire maybe uh, four years ago or five years ago, we were, we were evacuated for like two weeks. And um, we drove all the way to Las Vegas, which is like three and a half, four hours away. And the whole time, the trail, the huge plume of smoke was like going in the same direction as us. So we could look up where we were staying with Megan's parents and uh, and see the smoke from our own forest, which was just sort of, sort of bizarre being that far away, you know? Yeah, it's crazy how far. And I mean, it's it's interesting that Tuesday poem, too, that, you know, I didn't really think about it because it, it does think, say about, you know, you saying about it not being climate change, but I, I just... 
it's in and I mean I'm sure you heard about the California couple who had that gender reveal and then mm-hmm. you know it's it's just like you know sometimes we put these things on ourselves and it's yeah. just it's just crazy but I'm I'm glad you guys have been safe so far but it's just yeah, it's, yeah. I can't imagine you know unfortunately. Yeah, it, it's tough I, and I really the reason why even though you're not supposed to say stuff like it's not climate change the reason why I say it is it's really important we do the right thing and uh, the, the actual acres burned in wildfires, about one-fifth of the natural fire regime, as far as the number of acres. But like that you don't see it from Chicago ever is because we've been suppressing it for so long. I mean, it, it used to be a natural part of the landscape. And so what we need to do is have controlled burns um, running through between fire breaks um, regularly, like every 20 years or so, um, and, uh, and burn out all the fuel. And, and that's the natural way that it's, the world's supposed to work out here in the West. And we're not doing it, um, partly for insurance reasons, because one of the biggest forest fires in um, the history was started by a controlled burn that got out of control. And so people are scared to do it. But that's what we need to be doing. And then the other problem is people you know, complain about the smoke, but it's going to burn either way. So let's not burn in these super intense hot fires where there's too much fuel and they're creating clouds that blast into the stratosphere. And... Um, I don't know. It's just a topic that I, I can't not talk about because we live here. <laughs> you know, it, it's a terror every every year. And you were from New Jersey, right? So yeah, I was it's from like, New York, mm-hmm. so it's all completely new to me. And uh, and I knew yeah. nothing about them. I, I didn't I didn't realize it was a natural part of the landscape. Um, but it just it just is. It's there's there's um, trees that only uh, the the um, you know the redwoods or the sequoias. I think I can't remember which one. One of them only their seeds only open in the fire. There's whole plants the the poodle dog bush and things like that only come out when the fire, it's a rejuvenation kind of process. It's like a, like a Phoenix, you know, for the, for the natural environment. But we just have, it's built up so hot um, because of all the fuel that's just been sitting here for, from putting out fires as soon as they start for the last 80 or so years. Um, well, my son wants to be a firefighter and, uh, you know, it's, it's funny because it's just how many fire stations we actually visited, but I never say go out West that way, <laughs> but yeah. he loves that, uh, <laughs> fire and rescue. I don't know if you've seen it, the fire and rescue with blades and stuff, but it's, you know, I cried at the end of a Disney movie, but it's just, you know, it's, it's, it's crazy. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. I hear you. Uh, well, let's hear this poem. Um, the distance wildfire smoke traveled. Yeah, and it's or the distance of wire file smoke. I I couldn't get the title right, so but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> My summer blue skies hide behind the milkiness. I squint to see a bird dip their wings in the smog before disappearing. Do they cough when inhaling the fumes the wind carried? The sun's orange glow reminds me of the blaze thousand of miles away. It's burning groves of trees. People are fleeing their belongings. My mother faintly smells smoke and talks of the blood red moon that rises against the haze. The polluted blanket holds our small piece of the heavens hostage and I wait for it to clear. So the clouds can bring the rain and the sweltering heat can dissipate. Thanks for sharing that, Angela. The distance wildfire smoke traveled or whatever alternate title <laughs> you are so, so choose <laughs> yes thank you and you guys stay safe out there seriously yeah, we definitely will I, I spent i cleaned all my gutters and i raked all our leaves back from the house I got the defensible space going so we should be safe i hope um, okay good. yeah i'll take care angela have a good night you too thank you okay Bye. um let's see so let's go to let me say, too, before uh, we get off the topic, because I don't want to say there's nothing to do with climate change. There are some factors of climate change that matter. One of them is relative humidity. So even though as humidity rises from climate change, um, which, which makes you think it's moist, more moist, you know, the uh, relative humidity increases faster than regular humidity as the temperature rises. And so there's actually more evaporative stress. Um, but that's kind of mitigated by the fact that there's less Santa Ana wind events. Um, they've been going down for the last like 50 or 60 years, uh, which are the big winds that blow across the desert. That's diminishing because of climate change. Um, so, so it's sort of a mixed bag as far as climate change. But the forest management is such a big issue, and the solution is so clear. So, you know, tell people, spread the word, because uh, we just need controlled burns. 
Anyway, sorry for the soapbox. I just can't help it on this topic because, you know, I mean, look at this beauty out the, wo- out the window. It's just a wonderful place out here, but it's a, a scary place to live this time of year. So, um, yeah, the sun's starting to go down here in the, in the west. Anyway, let's go to uh, Julian Matthews next and see how he's doing. Hopefully things are, are a little bit better than they've been the last couple of weeks where he is. Hey, Julian, are you there? Hi. Hey, okay, so we can hear you. I don't have a, a video. Oh, there you come. Hello. So so I, I hate asking you every time, but are things getting any better there as far as the COVID goes? Sorry, I have no good news to report. <laughs> no. We've uh, crossed the 1 million number of infections mm-hmm. in the last uh, 17 months. So that's one in every 30 Malaysian has had COVID. Yeah. And and there's no like, the... vaccine availability or anything. Is no, that really it's there. Right? Vaccines are uh, going quite progressively. It's quite fast. Oh, that's we have good. About up to mm-hmm. a thousand people being uh, vaccinated every day. Yeah. Well, that, that's, that's good, good to hear. I, I mean, I'm feeling so guilty because we, you know, in this country, we have so many, and people just don't want them. <laughs> so, but I guess that's another topic. Um, so, what did you write a poem about this week? Uh, a, a person by the name of Hen Pak Tal. You can show the news link. Okay, yeah, I'll put this uh, up. This tweet. is the Hindustan Times. Let me, I'll put it up on screen. Here we go. Okay, so I have the article up. It so says, he tweeted his son misspelling. Yeah. It says, A dad shares post about kid writing all by himself. Tweet has hilarious twist. Um, imagine my son's excitement at having written something all by himself, reads part of the post dad shared. And then uh, it says, uh, do you want to explain what it says? It says, uh, bad mama, but I think you meant dad mama, what he calls them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, kids, yeah, all, we all were kids who were a little bit dyslexic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I thought it was funny that the father's uh, Twitter handle was henpecked. Uh huh. I worked on that, and you know, my my twisted mind uh, brought out this word. Yeah. Well, let's hear it. Go ahead. Whenever you're ready. Actually, hang on. I gotta put it in a in a document here. One second. Okay. So whenever you're ready, go ahead with it. Henpecked Al. Henpecked. That's what he was. His pals told him at the bar. A pecked hen. He thought. Packed like hen. Like those fattened chickens off to the slaughter in the truck they pulled behind on the highway one, solemnly peeking through the grills of cramped cages, one-eyed jacks in tiny caskets, cocked and ready to go off to their little death, to be defeaded and deboned, broiled and boiled, halved and quartered, sterile steroid nuggets of the masses, marinated supposedly in secret recipe then ordered from smart apps, packed for home delivery, to fill gutless bellies of sedentary food. I am not that chicken, he protested. I'm a rooster, he crowed, and returned home that night, drunk as a skunk, while the sly fox waited with bated breath. Another great ending. Uh, thanks for sharing that hen pecked tail and a nice uh, uh, humorous interlude. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, sure. Yep. yep. Again, that was uh, Julian Matthews with a uh, hen-pecked ale. And uh, let's see, who was left? Let's go to, we have um, Vicky Miko, Richard Westheimer, Nivedita. Let's see. Uh, Niv- Nivy's traveling. So she asked if I could read these poems for her. Let me Let me see what Nivy had for us today. This is uh, movie time. And we'll, we'll extend the, the, uh, the amusing 
aspect of the show right now with a uh, bear visits Tennessee mall checks movie show times. Let's see this article. Uh, this is from uh, UPI.com. A lot of pop-up ads on that website. How do I even get rid of this? That's one way. Um, bear visits Tennessee mall and checks movie times. So here's, here's the bear walking around at the mall. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, you, you don't have the sound, but but the the photographer says, "Hey, Mr. Bear." There he is, a, a black bear, and there's a Tennessee, a Tennessee mall shared videos of a young black bear that paid a visit to the shopping center. Was filmed apparently trying to find a way into the movie theater. So that is the uh, that is the article that Nivedita was writing about this week, and this is her poem, Movie Time. Movie time. This little bear was bored in the woods. So this little bear went into town to catch up with his friends and watch a movie at the mall. He ambled up to the door and checked the timings. The noon show was probably the best, and so purchased the tickets. This seat's too hard. This seat's too soft. Ah, this seat's just right. This popcorn is too buttery. This popcorn is not buttery enough. Ah, this popcorn is just right. And finally, he settled in comfy as a hibernating bear in winter. He enjoyed watching his friends, the rabbits, the duck, the skunk, the pigs, the cat, the taz, the marten, light up the silver screen during this noon show of Space Jam. <laughs> that is uh, Nivedita Karthik's poem about the bear in College Square Mall, Morristown, Tennessee. Thanks for sharing that, Nivedita. Um, Carla Schwartz is calling in too. I didn't miss you. Sorry, Carla. We we got everybody, I think. Um, so we'll get to Vicky Miko and Richard Westheimer and Carla Schwartz. Um, and then let's see the other poem by um, Nivedita. This is the county fair poem. After dusk at the county fair. After dusk at the county fair, the meadow gleams crimson, a flame like the bonfire soon to be lit. While all around folks aimlessly wander, men on stilts, dwarfs and giants, and even six-legged dogs. The chickens have long since gone to roost, and the pigs are snug in their blankets. Petting zoo time is done, and now it's time for the grown-ups to play, lit by the glow of a million fireflies. Writhing, shimmying, and tortuously twisting, the acrobats put on a show, fanning the flames, but the biggest show of all happens just past the glow of these red hot flames nice rhymes and rhythms there thanks for sharing that nivy two poems by nivedita karthik who is uh, traveling right now okay let us go next to um let's see let me read another poem while we're reading poems this is uh Ted Guevara, who um, wanted to share this poem. This is Ode, it's Violet Rhythm. He says, uh, I couldn't click on any idea on this week's prompt. I had a couple stanzas on Modigliani, Italian painter, but it's a bit of a stretch for him to be getting into county fairs and sunset. So for this week, I often op offer a poem from Nice. Reading it is optional, of course. Um, and of course, I'm still plugging the book in care of you, if you will. Okay, so um, yeah. Um, let me show this too while we're at it. There's a book of poems by Ted that he sent. Do I have it here? Hmm. I think it's called Nice. Um, oh, a poem from Nice. That's I, th I thought I was thinking Nice, France. Um, but it's Nice, his collection. And uh, hang on one second. Let me let me see if I can find it. Um, this is Violet Rhythm, and um, I'll put it in a word document. And, um, okay, this is the poem. And let me see if I can find this book. Hang on one second. Uh, I'm going to see if I can grab it. So I know I had it somewhere right around here. One, give, me, give me one second.
Okay, I'm back. Sorry about that. And let, let's read it from the actual book, I think. This is, uh, this is Ted's book here. Nice, which he sent to me just recently. And um, Ted Bernal Guevara. And um, let me find the poem he wanted to share. Where's the table of contents? Ted, you didn't include a table of contents? Well, let's see. If I see it flipping through really quick, we'll read it from the book. If not, we'll have to read it from the... Um, oh, here it is. Okay. Violet Rhythm by Ted uh, Bernal Guevara. And here we go. Oops, let me get rid of Julian for a second. Okay, this is Violet Rhythm. Ode to Claude Monet's Lavender Field and to Sophia Loren's Dance in Americano. Any sadness will go uninvited. Our eyes are filled, whether by Sophia's moves or Monet's harvest. We are in her alluring trance, we men and women, and we are without machete to cut splendor and peace. We would dance slow on the floor, let her take the lead, still, like the grooves between the purple fountains leading to our awestruck memory. I once had a love, one stranded on a highway in an oilless jeep. I was her only call from all the friends she had made. She wasn't Sophia, but she had danced me into her eyes. So deep I felt colors fused in the furnace of my soul. They stayed intact for the better half of our union. I carried her in the burden of Faraway, her face, her son. Now I stand in front of winter range by the highway, submitting again my honor, my aid to her distraught, no Monet in this darkening field, only dim sight with a misting edge to where my decency ran to. There, there was no Sophie Loren on the cold asphalt. But still I saw sway in the faint rhythm Monet can create, lovely blooms in the same sterile lot I saw. He must had caked his palate with the vibrant oils, eased them on a white parched canvas, then begot pieces of paradise I would never step into. For on that cold day my wife obstructed my vision with another man's child in her profile. She but ended the song, the careen of my clinging gift. I stood in silence as two works of art vanished in air. And once again, that was uh, Vi Violet Rhythm uh, from Nice, uh, Ted's book, which you can find. Um, it says River Sticks. Uh, let me see if I can find a link, to, because there's no link on the cover here. Um, Ted Vara River Sticks. Let's see if they have a... Um, I'm trying to find a link. Well, you can Google and try to find this book, or, or Google and find um, Ted Guevara. And... Uh, and his book that he sent is nice. Thanks for sharing this, Ted. I appreciate it. Always, if anybody wants to um, share any kind of poems from publications like this, I think that's one thing we do. I'd like to do more of. So if you want to send in books and, and give me a little note and say, hey, Tim, can you read this on the Rattlecast? I am happy to do that. Uh, these are open lines, and, and we like to do a lot of stuff on open lines. So uh, let's go to back to uh, callers, though. And whose turn was it next? I can't remember who I said. Let's call up a Richard Westheimer. And then we'll do um, Vicky Miko. Let's see. Vicky says hers is a bit long for now. Um, okay. If you think, I mean, I'm I'm not in any rush. We start a. Uh, we have time, Vicky. But but let's call up a uh, Vicky. Let me know if you want me to call you because I don't I don't I'm not running out of time. Uh, but let's call Richard first, and then uh, if Vicky wants to, and then we have Carla Schwartz too. I mean, I'm, I'm not. Hey, Richard, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing well, Tim. Um, what a wonderful interview tonight. And it was just came at a perfect time. You know, that you, you talked about that sort of Eeyore attitude, woe is me, about poetry. Mm -hmm. And this has just been one of those periods where it's just like dragging them out of the muck. Yeah. But, <laughs> Yeah, it's just, not an easy, uh, not an easy vocation being a poet. It's it's tough. You no, know, and you slog away, and and then uh, sometimes I don't know whether to take time off or or just to you know 
keep keep keep, keep swinging. Keep plugging. You know, my advice is to keep plugging because I took a little time off and I didn't write a poem for like five years or something, and I'm sad. You know, it's five years I didn't have anything. Uh, it was when mm-hmm. my kids were really little, and it was just really hard to find time. But I still could have. I mean, I'm writing a poem a week now, usually if I fin- if I finish. <laughs> right, if you finish them. Yeah. So um, anyway, yeah, well, that, I'd say that, keep going. But yeah, the interview was timely. It was it was really sort of like good 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 elixir. Yeah, well, I'm very gr- gr- glad to hear that. Um, so, what did you want to share tonight? Uh, so I do have a prompt poem which I'd start with, and if there's time, I'd, I'd do my poets respond poem. Yeah, yeah, sure. I don't think we're in any rush, so uh, go okay. ahead uh, with both. Uh, I have the prop poem up, though, so why don't you start with Yeah, and the, and the prop poem, uh, the, it's it's interesting. You know, there are a number of formal poems or semi-formal poems, and, uh, you know, yours, Megan's, there were a couple of others that were, you know, had rhyming couplets, and um, I think the title, the prompt you gave was very musical. Yeah, that's and, the thing. That's why I tried to villain now, because it just felt like that was a line, so. Yeah. Um, so, and of course, formal stuff leads you in different directions. So, uh, this is provisionally titled when the sun went down for good at the county fair, when the sun went down at the county fair and the lights came out at the pacing track, I placed my bet on a Rowan mare, though the last she ran at last, she ran at the back of the pack. But two bucks was all I had, and I yearned to play the midway later that night, and the hopes of this 16-year-old turned on a 20-to-1 nag winning despite her nose for clover rather than the finish line. Perhaps why I chose her instead of the rest, my prep school classmates all having designs on Harvard, Yale, and being possessed of fast girls, fancy, fast cars, fancy girls, and star turns on the team while I read Vonnegut and tripped out to the dead. And while they partied, I took to the streets, stopped the war, banned the bombs, stopped eating meat. Back on the track, my long shot won. With 40 bucks and a long night ahead, adrenaline took over and I started to trust that I had the skills to beat the spread. 20 more times I lay money down on long shots, sure bets, none of them won. I walked out in the night in the dizzying lights, the carnies, the barkers and couples hand in hand, the girls clutching plush animals, the guys with big grins, They'd all bet on something I'd yet to learn. That just going out, just having fun, not having a script was important, even for those like me concerned with justice, peace, LSD, and jam bands. I gazed at the tilting, the spinning, the ghoulish booths, the pinhead man, the boy with four hands, the shrieking wild rides, and realized the truth was there are worlds where I'll never fit in. I've never gone to the fair again. Oh, that was great, Richard. Yeah, another, uh, people are coming up with great endings today, and that was a a, a great turn there. I really like that poem. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Tim. It was good to have the prompts. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. It's hard to write without some kind of prompting for me anyway. Um, and then the other poem... Um, the other poem was two unnamed people emerge from depression under completely different circumstances, which was based on a local story where a dog fell through a roof in a garage. Oh, I remember and, that from reading that yesterday. Yeah. yeah and fell between um, two walls, one that had been built to shore up the roof mm-hmm. and went missing for five days. And uh, it was a happy, very happy ending mm-hmm. with the, you know, the big butt wagging on the dog. When, <laughs> yeah. uh, it, was, it was a very sweet, sweet video of the ending. The yeah. poem's not so sweet. Okay. Well, let's hear Maybe I'll play the video afterward. Let's hear okay. the poem now. Um, she went missing, gone. I found her wedged tightly between two walls. One, a poured slab of despair. The other built block by block from the jumble of days. I thought she'd been taken but she'd fallen in through a rotting roof (coughs) and there was no way to get her out from there without intervention. So I busted out the saws and sledgehammers and got to work. Well, really, I'm lying. The reality, 
I passed by those walls, heard her calls, peered in and saw her stuck in that crevice. I'd call down, tell her, you should climb up from there, up the slime-slick sides. You have a choice, I'd say, whether or not to stay in that dim-lit cell. Depression's just a gimmick, a trick they play on you. And anyway, scientists say smiling helps you get happy. So smile, take control. What kind of man could be so cruel? On her own, she'd steal rays of the sun as it passed a crack above her trap. She'd crawl out to feed the kids, call a friend, cry, and then fall back in over and over until time crumbled the walls, did the work I was not inclined to do. Then I fell through that same decaying roof into my own ashen place, My hours went flat gray, and there was no way I could uncurl from my fetal ball enough to care. But she'd sit by me, quiet. With her there, I sighted a familiar star in the night sky, one that pierced the fog, was oriented just so as it wheeled over the slit above me, a filament of light moored tight to Arcturus, lowered was a line she could hold on as she reached for my hand, held it long enough for other stars to gather, and, with all that enchantment, caused the walls to dissolve. Whereupon I stood, stretched my arms wide, relieved, breathed deeply at last, and asked, what kind of man could accept such a gift as this, having given none? She replied, you have no choice. Another excellent poem. Thanks so much for sharing that too, Richard. And uh, get a drink of water too. <laughs> I was... Yeah, yeah. I was looking around for one. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Yeah, I was thinking about interrupting and, and reading the end for you, but I'm glad you got through it. <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Yeah, have a good night. Always great talking to you. Thanks. Bye. Bye. There was a Richard Westheimer with two poems, uh, Two Unnamed People Emerge from Depression Under Completely Different Circumstances. A powerful one. Let me see if I can find the video. Um, for this if it'll play let's see so there's an advertisement how long is this advertisement going to be 10 seconds i can ramble for 10 seconds and then show it unless you want to know about the um jake sweeney automotive 100 years of excellence uh okay let's see is this going to play okay this is playing so um you're not going to get the audio unless i turn the audio on but there's a dog that was rescued from under the rubble Oh, look at that. He's coming out. Um, let's see. I can turn on the audio. Let's see what we get. Oh, it's on mute. Sit ...across this neighborhood, seeking help in finding Gertie. She was later found in an unlikely place that her owners least expected. I never really felt hopeless. And I, had, I really thought somebody took her in or she found some place. That and it. that's what happened. Gertie... Yeah, Gertie was found there between two concrete walls. So um, I won't play the whole video, but um, great to see Gertie and her owner there, um, Connie Fix, I think it said. So, um, yeah, interesting take on that poem. Thanks for sharing that. Once again, Richard Westheimer. And uh, we have Carla Schwartz for sure. And um, so Vicky, uh, and we'll do Vicky too. So where'd Carla go? Let me find Carla. Here's Carla Schwartz. I'm in no rush tonight. We have everything uh, lined up and good to go. I'm going to shut the other thing. No okay. problem, Carla. <laughs> yeah, here I am. Okay, so, so how glad are you doing? to be here tonight. Yeah. I'm doing pretty well. I never haven't laughed so hard in, an, in a rattle cast, I think, ever. <laughs> well, that's good it to hear. A, it was a very good laughing night for me. Oh, um, that's great. That's great. Yeah. Um, so yeah, otherwise I'm doing great. Although I did fall off a dock two days ago. Oh, I'm sorry not, to hear that. Yeah, it was bad, bad. So I'm recovering. But, um, anyway, so I have this poem that I actually wrote. I only saw the thing, the, uh, prompt today. So I wrote it today and then I modified it. So I sent you the second version. Yeah, I have that here. Great. So it's called, um, July 10th. 1991, Chittenden County Fair. 
As the sun started its wane, his texts standed his guitars. We spotted him booted thin from midway up the bleachers. I'd won tickets to see Dylan from the radio that day. John and I waited for him as we swatted mosquitoes away. Dylan slinked out his slow pace, started in with new morning like he couldn't stand the, this place. All the songs, he phoned them in. What we expect from the fair's bandstand, John pointed out a pig rooting in sand. Excellent poem. Thanks so much for sharing that. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it was fun to write it. You know, when I saw the prompt, I was like, well, the only county fair I've ever been to <laughs> was this one. <laughs> well, that's great. So, yeah, great story. Great poem. Thanks for sharing that, Carla. And hope you feel better soon thank from, you. The, from the fall. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Good night. Yep, good night. Okay, and last up, we're going to have uh, Vicky Miko on. This is a longer poem, but like I said, we have uh, plenty of time. Hey, Vicky, how you doing tonight? Hi. I'm oh, still listening to Carla's poem. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, turn off that turn off that stream that you're watching okay. on. And uh, and just listen to me here. Carla, I didn't hear the end, Carla. Sorry. <laughs> I'll have to re I'll yeah. have to listen to it again. Yeah. Okay, uh, Is that off? Well, <laughs> Is that off? Yes. Okay. Uh, to be. Yeah. So what which one did you want to share? The, the prompt poem? I have a prompt poem. Okay. Yes. Um, that uh, By the way, that was a wonderful interview. I could listen to you guys all night, and the whole night has been just really great. Oh, thanks so much. So the, the um, I kind of misread the title of, of the prompt that uh -huh. you gave. Uh, that was, uh, I thought it was When the Sun Gods Go Down. At the county fair. Oh, interesting. Well, that's always fun. Instead misreading. of when the sun yeah. goes down, I just kind of sort of, I don't know, I kind of misread it. So anyways, here's my poem. My poem. Okay. The Tale of a Heedless Booty. When the God inside you says to appease a need that comes on every summer, when that one sweaty dog's day comes to skitter, excuse me, to skitter, <clears throat> skewer all your blasphemous invasions, you know, the ones that riddle and ruin your beautiful temple body. Yes, just one day makes it all so much less self-despicable. After all, you've gone through starving yourself the week before in sacred preparation for the avalanche of shameless Lollapalooza delights and tilt -a whirl sicknesses so unattainable otherwise. You allow yourself one holy violation, a willful, piggish debauchery of all mindful senses opening wide. The day's night when your body's corpuscles fondle all its gushers, your gut pulses almost bursting to the pinnacle of internal impalation. Yes, after the day-long assaults of frying fajitas, porta potty perfume, and mini donuts, their boiling generators, gassy noise, meeting your carnival scented vomit, dust whipping rodent redolence and skunky thermals of foul humanity. Oh yes, it stings your eyes, your nostrils craving to be cleansed, but not just yet, not just yet. When your riddled bones cannot hold another ounce of weight, when one last bloat call sears your periphery, your mesials still sticky with hot caramel drool, your salt puffed lips have just enough primal urge left to order a quart of sourdough and a quart of whiskey stew. You stand there leaning on the porta potty door and suck out the last succulent lamy marrow. Your Swollen red tongue buds approve in righteous satisfaction when you unconsciously wipe your greasy burnt fingers, butter fingers across your grody jaw, sopping slowly down and over your ballooned belly. 
unaware you were luscious prey for someone waiting in the void to rupture your misery. Excellent. And then we have uh, another f- um, beautiful photographs again. Um, the shadows here, and then photo from the fair. Um, excellent work. Yeah, I, I, I love uh, love seeing well, your thanks. photographs too, Viggy. Thanks. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, my pleasure. Have That's a great. good night. Okay, you too. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Yes, yeah, so that was Vicky Miko. And if you didn't catch this, is a great photo too uh, from the beginning, um, beginning of the, the beginning slide, I guess you could call it. This is uh, chocolate covered corn dogs, deep fried butter, and chocolate covered bacon at the Bacon Bliss Tent <laughs> at the county fair. Man, that just gives me a stomach ache just looking at it. <laughs> thanks for thanks for sharing that, Vicky. And I believe let me do one last run through, make sure I didn't miss anybody because I would hate to do that. Um, but I believe we got everybody in who uh, is here and wanted to share a poem. Um, I will go, let's see. Is there any? Yeah, I think that, oh, Gail Hemmen. So uh, there's one more poem from Gail Hemmen. And Gail hasn't been here in a while, but she sent this. So I think I'm going to share it. I'm not sure um, uh, where Gail's been for the live shows. Maybe Sunday isn't as good of a time for her. But let me... Uh, let me share this. This is a, uh, it's not a very long poem. Um, it is a, uh, let me get the good size. Better. Uh, let me read Gail's note. This is a uh, written in response to the Rally Young Poets Anthology, a new stories about the Delta variant and current pandemic and discussion with a writer, teacher and professional leader about the potential of poetry sharing during the pandemic for youth and adults as well. And this is poem 2021 um, by uh, Gail Hemmen. And here we go. This is going to close out the show tonight. Poem 2021. I heard a fly buzz while on Zoom. So excited I had not sealed the room. For the poets. We were soon joining on the screen. I asked the humble fly to please remain unseen. The buzz became louder as the poets gather. Soon the shared buzzing all that mattered. Though though separated by miles, the time just flew by. Zoom squares soon seen with the eyes of a fly. For when poets share their voices in a room, the humble buzzing fly quickly starts to zoom. Oh, what magic when we can share the buzz, the flies at my house, yet you feel the fuzz? Hopefully soon we'll meet by more than just zoom, but soon as the flies heard... We've already entered the room. And that is for the poets of the Olympia Poetry Network after Emily Dickinson. Thanks so much for the great way to end the, the show tonight. And again, that was Gail Hemmen with a poem 2021. And now, as I mentioned, uh, the uh, we're, we're heading out a little bit, so there's going to be no critique of the week this week. We're going on a little bit of a road trip, um, but we will be back for next week's Rattlecast. So uh, we're skipping critique of the week. But we'll be back for the Rattlecast. And uh, the prompt for next week's Rattlecast is going to be... Oh, wait, no. I forgot my Saiku. Man. Sorry, everybody. So this Saiku... And I, guess I like to write a little Saiku just to show that you can write a poem about anything. It's a fun way to quickly end the show. And uh, this article, I didn't really understand. I have to be honest with you. Yeah, this is the article. i got to get rid of Vicky. Um, the article here says, uh, Feel good... Brain messenger can be willfully controlled, new study reveals. And so scientists uh, at the University of San Diego, I believe, were looking at uh, the dopamine circuits within mice. And there's been a lot of studies about um, the way dopamine functions in the external reward system. It's like the the thing that governs operant conditioning, basically, and lets us um, you know be rewarded for the things that we do. But there are also these spontaneous passive signals that come about for mice about once every minute where there's a little bit of a spike in um, these dopamine pulses. And um, so there's a great art, too, by Julia Cool, who illustrated this article for, uh, for the press release at, at UC San Diego. Um, and uh, this was work published in Current Biology. And they um, scanned um, the mice's dopamine production while giving them rewards and, and interacting with them, and got the mice, they taught the mice to increase their own dopamine production in a weird way. 
And, um, and what I don't really understand is what the implications are. But it kind of seems, because it's kind of written in a way that's hard to follow. But it kind of um, seems to be saying that, um, that this spontaneous generation of dopamine, which we do too, it, just at different intervals, um, governs the way we seek new gratification, new rewards, um, and sort of makes us feel less... I don't know, less satisfied. So we keep looking for more and don't just sit around because that's what it's doing for the mice here. And uh, so anyway, here is my haiku inspired by that. Um, here we go. I'm going to drop Vicky down too. Summer breeze, the chimpa, chimpmunks, <laughs> chipmunks forage under my hammock. Summer breeze, the chipmunks forage under my hammock. That is my psyche for the day and a little news story, some science news to share with you. And now next week's prompt is this right here. Um, it's, a, it's a more open-ended kind of prompt. A nonce poem or a nonce form is a, one you make up yourself. Make up your own nonce form and write a poem using it. Be sure to include a short explanation of the rules. So the, the prompt for next week is to write your own poem. Make up your own style. Like, um, you know, Lester Graves Lennon, who um, has a book coming out soon, but we interviewed him in Rattle Number 50. And the reason we did is because I kept getting all these poems that were called Lennon lyrics. And it turned out to be a form that Lester made up. And um, the Lennon lyric. So make up your own form. Give it a name um, if you want. Although it's not a nonce form if you give it a name. Once, you, once it's named and, and becomes more than that, then it's more than a nonce. But start with a nonce form. Make something up. Uh, make up certain rules. And then share that with us and, and give it a name and, and let us know what uh, your form is. And that's what the prompt is for next week. And next week's guest in the Rattlecast is going to be Roy Bentley, another poet um, from our tribute to Appalachian poets. Uh, Roy Bentley, just a great writer. I talked to him on a preview of the show yesterday because we did that a little bit ahead of time. And um, just a great guy. It's going to be fun. It's going to be just as fun as talking to Jack Riddle, I, I swear. Um, his newest book is Hillbilly Guilt, which just came out a couple months ago. And... Um, a great guy, great poet. His poem, um, we published him maybe three, four times again. And um, in the current issue as well is one of the great poems in there. So um, that's Rattlecast number 104 with Roy Bentley and your Knots poems. Sunday, August 1st, the regular time, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Hope to see you then. Hope to uh, hope you have a great week. And uh, thanks for, for all you do. I really appreciate having the audience here. Uh, and show your appreciation back, too, if you do, with like clicking the like button and all that. Okay, have a good night. We'll talk to you later. Bye.